One minute remaining. Forty-five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Nationwide, this is the Zach Gelb Show. Here's your host, Zach Gelb. Live from the palatial yet not overly ostentatious studios of the Infinity Sports Network, this is the Zach Gelb Show across all the great local Infinity Sports Network affiliates, Sirius XM, Channel 158, the free Odyssey app, and of course streaming live on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Infinity Sports Net. 855-212-4227 is the number to jump on in, 855 212 4227. You could always get at me on Instagram where I'm straight flexing or via the good old cesspool of Twitter at Zach Gelb. That's Z A C H G E L B. Got Moist Mike, got Stuart Kovacs rocking and rolling, jamming out with me all the way up until 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific today. Field Yates, ESPN NFL draft expert. He's going to stop by coming up in about an hour 40 from now. At 4.40 p.m. Eastern, 1.40 p.m. Pacific today. Uh, I got an early start to the morning because our buddy Dexter Henry, he does some updates here on the Infinity Sports Network. He invited me to uh, come on down to his TV show that he does through SNY, which is a local TV station here in New York and uh, via the New York Post as well. And I was dressed up very nicely. Like, I never get dressed up for for this show because it's radio, like the way that I would for TV. But I had on a nice T-shirt. I had on a very nice sports coat. And I thought to myself, hmm, maybe I'll come into work all dressed up. And then I thought to myself, you know what? I don't want to deal with the questions. Like, if I walked into this office with a sports coat or any time I have walked into this office with a sports coat, I get two questions. Were you at a funeral Or where were you interviewing at earlier this morning? So I elected to take the sports coat off since uh, Dexter's TV studio and where he does the show is uh, literally five minutes from my apartment. So I did go back home after that, hung up the sports coat, uh, made sure that it's going to now get a bunch of dust on it until the next time I do need that. But anyway, we got a whole lot to do today. Uh, We will honor John Sterling. We will honor Vern Lundquist as Vern Lundquist has wrapped up his illustrious broadcasting career with his uh, 40th Masters that he did call on Sunday on uh, the 16th green. And obviously that has been hole 16 iconic for Vern Lundquist amongst any many other things. But this was the last broadcasting assignment he's had recently since he did walk away from calling college football and college basketball on CBS. And then yesterday... We had some breaking news, and there wasn't a lot of clarity on it. Some people were speculating it was a health issue, which we've now found out is not the case, at least the way that it was presented publicly yesterday. But John Sterling, the longtime legendary voice of the New York Yankees, is calling it quits, and he will be honored at the uh, big ballpark in the Bronx coming up on Saturday, and there will be a whole pregame ceremony 
And uh, we will say goodbye to John Sterling. So we'll talk about some of our favorite play-by-play announcers coming up 20 minutes from now. Bill Belichick turns 72 years old today. Where will he coach next? And we gear up for the NFL draft that comes your way next Thursday. So we'll do all that stuff, all that jazz, and we're going to have a good show for you today. But I have to start off in the association. And we have the play-in tournament that does commence tonight in the Western Conference. And I saw Stu already gave a smile because he knows I'm not a fan of the play-in tournament. I am not a fan of the commissioner in Adam Silver. And Spineless Silver, this was his idea because he wants to make the NBA like soccer, like football. And I'm not about that. And to no surprise, the NBA product has not been great the last few years. But the postseason at least brings some excitement. Uh, I don't want to say that you could sleep through the first two rounds, but I don't feel like there's a lot of teams that could actually win the championship. Um, You know, the Celtics can win the championship. The Nuggets can win the championship. But outside of those two, and even the Celtics I have some conflicting feelings about, but one team at least has to go to the NBA Finals in the Eastern Conference. I don't know how many more teams can win the championship. Like, I would say the Bucs. But Giannis Antetokounmpo is not going to play the first few games of the uh, first round series dealing with an injury. I think Miami can get to an NBA Finals like they've proven in the past, but I don't believe they could win a championship. And just because Joel Embiid is now back doesn't mean that all of a sudden I'm going to take the bait and say the Sixers are going to the NBA Finals. And I don't think the Knicks are a team that could get to the NBA Finals. So in the East, I would be surprised if it's not the Boston Celtics. In the West, I will not pick against the Nuggets against the East or the West against any of the opponents until they go down. Because I think the Nuggets are going back-to-back just like how UConn did and just like how the Kansas City Chiefs did. But a team like the Thunder, we've seen this before. Great regular season. Like Memphis a few years ago. Great regular season. But just because you have a great NBA regular season doesn't mean it translates into the postseason. The Timberwolves are compelling to me. The Clippers... Another year where it's a murky situation with Kawhi Leonard's health, and it's unfortunate. And then you look at the Mavericks. You know, the Mavericks with Kyrie and Luka, I don't want to say I'm trusting them because I I don't trust Kyrie, but it seems like there's good synergy as of late between those two. I know some will look at the Suns and they'll be like, okay, you know, they have the talent, but I just don't think they have the depth. And I don't trust the Phoenix Suns uh, to go to the NBA Finals. So, pretty much, and I know it's not chalk because it's not one and one, but it's pretty damn close to chalk. I'm going to go Celtics up against the Nuggets. That will be the NBA Finals. And I think that will make for the best NBA Finals. But when we get to the play-in tournament tonight, I want to see two things happen in the Western Conference, which leads to one thing. The New Orleans Pelicans are hosting the the, uh, Los Angeles Lakers. The winner of this game will go up against the Nuggets in the first round because it's a 7-8 game. You win, you're in. I want to see the Pelicans win tonight. And I want to see LeBron James lose tonight. It's nothing anti-Laker. It's nothing anti-Stuart Kovacs because he's a Lakers fan and I want to see him miserable. No, 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 no. Has nothing to do with... Me rooting against the Lakers because I want to see them fail. I think, for one, Zion Williamson, younger, right, has been disappointing so far, but very quietly has had a very good and productive season. In an isolated moment tonight, with everyone watching at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, I think it would be very good for the NBA. For Zion Williamson against the King. To, I don't want to say dethrone him, but to defeat him and to secure a spot in the postseason where Zion Williamson falls out. So if that happens, you'll see the bigger picture here because Zion Williamson isn't the driving factor in this segment. But if that happens, then the Lakers play for their postseason lives coming up on Friday night. And on the back end of the doubleheader tonight in the West, You have Golden State and Sacramento. And in this matchup, I want to see Golden State win. Because if you give me a Golden State victory tonight, and remember that's 9-10, so the loser of this is Dunzo, they're out, they're finished. 
if you give me a Golden State victory tonight with Steph Curry and you have a Los Angeles Lakers loss, that sets us up for a very nice collision course matchup on Friday to actually make us care and to actually make us want to watch. If you could give me Golden State going up against the Lakers, Steph going up against LeBron, I'm all in for that. Because here's the thing about the playing tournament. And, and the 7-8 games and 9-10 and, and games. The reason why even I could admit that they've been successful is because you've had a lot of stars play in these games. Like, let's be real. When you look at the play-in tournament in the East, yeah, you're going to watch Heat Sixers coming up tomorrow night. But are people really going to give a rat's ass? about the Hawks and the Bulls, like nationally I'm talking about. Will people nationally be buzzing about the Hawks and the Bulls? Absolutely not. So when you have stars in the playing tournament, the playing tournament works. But what that means is that those stars didn't have productive regular seasons. They didn't try as hard in the regular season or they kind of dogged it in the regular season. And that's the biggest issue I have with the NBA right now is it feels like the NBA regular season doesn't matter. So in essence, we are rewarding teams like the Hawks and like the Bulls and like the Kings and the Warriors who shouldn't belong in this postseason. And we're extending their seasons. And I know people will say, Well, it takes away from teams tanking, Zach. Does it really? Because last year, if memory serves me correct, which it does in this case, it didn't prevent the Dallas Mavericks from tanking to try to get into the lottery. They didn't really try their hardest to get into this play-in tournament. So that's why there's hypocrisies in this play-in tournament. But I could only deal with what we have. And the best thing to bring the most excitement out of this play-in tournament. Because let's be real, in the East, Heat Sixers is the only one you're going to care about. But in the West, we need two things to happen. We need a Pelicans victory tonight, and we need a Golden State victory. Because that leads us to maybe one last time, Steph Curry going up against LeBron James in a postseason. Because that's another thing. The future of both of these franchises will be the biggest storyline this summer in the NBA, right? LeBron can opt out. I don't think LeBron is leaving. I'll tell you later in the show why he should and where he should go. That's what we call a tease in this business. And then the Warriors, you have Draymond Green, where Golden State, for some reason, still with after all this jackassery and nonsense, that Draymond Green has put through his entire team the last two years, they still think he's necessary. They still are afraid of holding Draymond Green accountable. So as long as Draymond's there, and I said this last year in the offseason when I said that they should not have extended him and not brought him back and not give him a good uh, new deal, as long as Draymond's there, the juice is going to continue to not be worth the squeeze. And he'll be a detriment to that team moving forward. It doesn't mean... That Draymond wasn't great for the Warriors for all those years. He absolutely was. But there's an expiration date for everybody. And his expiration date should have been last offseason, but they wanted to extend life in Draymond Green with the Golden State Warriors. But Clay Thompson, his deal is up at the end of the year. So those iconic names and the iconic trio of Curry, of Draymond, and Clay, you know, they lose tonight. This could be the last time we see that trio on the court. And even if they win tonight, it's not like I think they're going to be able to do enough while keeping those three intact where next year we're going to be sitting here and saying, oh, watch out. The Splash Brothers are back. Here come the Golden State Warriors. And it's kind of sad to see what the Warriors have turned into because we know Steph is still great. The injuries have derailed Klay Thompson's career. And then for Draymond, he just can't get out of his own head. And he's done a bunch of stupid and violent acts on a basketball court. But 
I want a reason to watch the playing tournament. I want a reason to watch the early rounds of the NBA postseason, and I'll do it either way. But if you tell me I have to move my plans around and move my life around on Friday to buy into the eight seed games in the East and the West to determine who's going to the eighth seed, yeah, give me the stars. Give me LeBron. Give me Steph and have them go up against one another because just having those two big names will make me want to watch. But if the Lakers win tonight, and let's say you have the Kings win tonight, even though I like the Aaron Fox and Mike Brown, and you're giving me the Kings going up against the Pelicans, and I don't think that draws a great national reaction. It could be a good game. Like, don't get me wrong, but I don't think there's a lot of juice nationally with that matchup. The juice would be with Steph Curry going up against LeBron James one more time. What do you want to see in the play-in tournament? I think you know my answer by now. 855-212-4227. 855-212-4227. By the way, I think that's the toughest point in this whole network name change. Since we are no longer CBS Sports Radio and now we're the Infinity Sports Network, I have to pause every time I say the phone number. Because for years it was, it's the same phone number, 855-212-4227. But that also spells out 855-212-4CBS. So that makes it a little bit tricky. But hey, we're all getting uh, used to the new things around here. Which, not much of it, it's new. You still have Maggie and Pearl off in the mornings. You still got Bill Ryder as well. The legendary, the franchise Jim Rome. That bloviating jackass in the afternoons, your boy Zach Gelb. You got JR after me, then the great Bart Winkler, and then Amy Lawrence. And I'll say, good job on Amy. Um, I did not know this. I didn't know Amy has been teaching classes the last few years at a new house at Syracuse. So Amy was, I guess, teaching her class in person. I guess it's usually virtual, which a lot of things are virtual now. Like Ash Shador Sanders, he finally showed up to, to class and he caused the big scene because usually, right, athletes, they take uh, classes virtually. A lot of people take classes virtually. So I guess Amy did an in-person class and she invited her students to watch her radio show last night. That's pretty damn cool. Like if you're in college, like a, even though I'm not the biggest fan of Syracuse, you know, personally, but um, I could acknowledge greatness. We all know their great broadcasting program. If you had a professor that's on the radio doing a national show and they invite you to your broadcast, that's a pretty damn cool experience. So uh, good on Amy Lawrence uh, giving on back and, uh, you know, teaching the kids and making sure we have a future in this business with the next fine sports talk show host. All right, it is the Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. We'll take a time out. When we come on back, we'll tell you who our favorite play-by-play announcers are of all time. Coming off Vern Lundquist, wrapping up at the Masters, and John Sterling calling it quits, as we did find out yesterday, as a legendary play-by-play voice of the New York Yankees. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining.
Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Welcome back to the Infinity Sports Network. Yeah, yeah, that's us. It's the Infinity Sports Network. I am Zach Gelb, the host of the Zach Gelb Show. We're real creative around here. Uh, Vern Lundquist, last thing he was doing was the uh, Masters on hole 16. Now, no more. We knew that on Sunday that would be his final time broadcasting on uh, CBS for the Masters. And uh, we didn't know that there would be a domino effect after that, where John Sterling, who's been doing the Yankee games for a long time, he uh, is walking away, which is crazy. And John Sterling is like 85, 86 years old as well. So uh, God bless him and obviously a wonderful career. I have a voicemail on my phone still to this day from John Sterling. And he is the same person on the air. As he is off the air. I, when I was working at a station that Stu actually worked at, 920 AM New Jersey, where Stu and I were both young 
and uh, we were just uh, finding a way to break into this business, I reached out to John Sterling to come on my afternoon radio program where I was the uh, sports director of the radio station as well and the uh, program director. And I left John a message. He got back to me. And the, and the minute and a half voicemail that he left me was as if he was doing play-by-play when talking to me. He was like, hey, Zach, how you doing? This is John Sterling, the voice of the Yankees. Um, I'm on the air today broadcasting the game in the big ballpark in the Bronx. But afterwards, and I know you do an afternoon radio program. Um, I'll be sitting in traffic, may I add you, which will probably be for a long time. So if you want me to come on then, I'd be glad to do it. Hope all is well with you and your family. And uh, hopefully we can connect and talk some great Yankee baseball. This is John Sterling. <laughs> like that was the voicemail. And I was pretty damn close to word for word. So uh, that was pretty cool. And then he came on the show for, I was going to say about 10 minutes, but it's 20 minutes because you asked four questions of John Sterling and it's entertaining, but man, uh, that dude uh, definitely, as someone that could talk, that dude can definitely talk like no other. So let's do this. Let's play some Vern. Let's play some John Sterling. This is one of my favorite Vern calls. Now, it's always difficult when you have the TV play-by-play guy compared to the radio play-by-play guy, because the radio play-by-play guy has to speak and paint the picture and give you every single detail. There's more silence with the TV broadcaster because obviously you could see what's going on. And in TV, the difference of TV to radio is in TV they try to tell you to lay out. Because if something big happens, you give your call, and then you lay out, and you just let the pictures and the natural sound of the crowd take over. But on the radio, people can't see things. There's the big revelation of the day. So you have to detail every little moment. So here is Verm back in uh, 2005. This is the Tiger Woods iconic chip shot on 16. Listen up. So that, to me, is one of my favorite calls, even though it was so simple, because I'm a massive Tiger Woods fan. And when you were watching that, that was everyone's reaction. You saw the ball slowly roll onto the green, and as it's rolling and rolling and rolling, everyone was saying, oh, my goodness. And then it just stops right at the lip of the jar. And it sat there for about like a second, Enough to take a deep breath, and then it falls in, and it's like, wow. So that was such a cool call. And what made that call so cool is years later, when Tiger went on to win his last major so far, which was the triumphant return, Tiger hits a great shot at 16. And as he's walking to 17, Vern says, I'm compelled to say, oh, my goodness. Because you knew at that time Tiger was going to make the triumphant return to winning a major championship. Now, This isn't the best call of the moment because on the radio, the kick six Iron Bowl, Auburn, Alabama, the Auburn radio call is one of the all-time great calls I have ever heard. But here is Vern calling the kick six on CBS. 57 yards. Remember a blocked kick to go the other way, too. He's got to be careful and get it up. On the way. No, returned by Chris Davis. Davis goes left. Davis gets a block. Davis has another block. Chris Davis. No flags. Touchdown. Auburn. An answered prayer. And then after that, I think they laid out for like about over two minutes where they just showed all the euphoria on one side, the heartbreak on another. Like, it was a long layout where they did not speak for, like, at least two minutes and 20 seconds, I think, if memory serves me right. Now let's go to John Sterling. Samter pulled together a uh, little home run calls, a few of them from his great home run calls where we do a little play on words or come up with something uh, for 
the players that obviously have hit big home runs like uh, Bernie Williams was burn, baby, burn. Giancarlo Stanton. Giancarlo. No see poisto parlo. I think I got that right. Do you have a favorite? Uh, is burn, baby, burn? You being a Yankee guy, is that your favorite one there, Samter? We'll have to listen to him. Okay. Sam, uh, Stu, what you, what's your favorite, Sterling? I think Bernie or Posada are my two favorite ones. What was, uh, was it Hip Hip Jorge? Hip Hip Jorge, Georgie Juice one. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, uh, he juiced one? Yeah. Oh, that could be a Well, that could for the yeah, be a play. Team. Yeah, you don't want that. Did you know Jorge Posada allegedly would urinate on his hands before games? Him and, and Moises Alou. I remember reading that as a youngster. So, I always, because uh, Posada never had the batting gloves on, right? So, that's no what, he, gloves, that's what nope. he did uh, before games. That's what sources did tell you, boy. Uh, A-Rod was also great. An A-bomb from A-Rod. But uh, let's listen up to a little John Sterling. It is high. It is far. It is gone. gone. Bernie goes boom. He kills a home run the short way in the right field seats. <laughs> from A-Rod, the Giambino, a thriller from Godzilla. That's a great one. A and blast. All rise. Here comes the judge. Let the guardy party begin. Mark Teixeira sends a text message into the right field seats. You're the Mark Teixeira. John Carlo. No, si po, sto parlo. Gio Ashella, the most happy fella. It is Glaber Day. And like a good Glaber, Torres is there. <laughs> That's awesome. My father actually has a good relationship with John Sterling. And he gave him a suggestion once when Hideki Matsui was playing for the Yankees and he hit an upper deck home run. It was an upper decky from Hideki. And he used that and actually gave credit to my dad on the broadcast. I wish I still had that, but it got lost uh, in all the files throughout the years. But anyway, my two favorite play-by-play calls of all time. Not my favorite play-by-play guy, but my two favorite play-by-play calls of all time. Uh, one is is vi- the legendary Vin Scully when he called Sandy Koufax's perfect game when he did the 2-2 two and two to Harvey Keene. He's like, 2-2 two and two to Harvey Keene. And the reason why I love that is I remember when I was pitching um, as a youngster in Little League, anytime I would get nervous, you would kind of try to not think or do something right as uh, <laughs> as it was said in Happy Gilmore that brings you to your happy place. So when Dad and I would have catches in the backyard, he would always say, two and two to Harvey Keen. And even though that was nowhere near my lifetime, it just kind of mellowed the nerves a little bit. And then you know that it's one of these uh, famous calls that gets played for years and years and years and uh, will still get played for years and years to come. But my favorite play-by-play call of all time is the great Al Michaels. And all I have to say is 1980 hockey, and you know how it sounds. The Yolentin off gets checked by Ramsey. The Clanahan is there. The puck is still loose. 11 seconds. You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. Morrow up to show. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! So those are my two favorite play-by-play calls of all time. And it's subjective because it's my favorite. And it's like, what does that moment mean to you? But Miracle's my favorite movie of all time. And obviously, you know the history, not that I was alive in 1980, of uh, obviously what that win and that run did mean uh, for the world and also USA Hockey. So my favorite play-by-play broadcaster ever. And there's a ton, right? We could sit there and we could do this for hours and hours and hours. But for me... It's Mike Doc Emmerich. Energy, check. Creativity, check. I I didn't know that there was about 15,000 different ways that you could say the word pass without saying the word pass. But Mike Emmerich has found every single way. And anytime he announced, it's a big thing. Doesn't matter if the game isn't big. But when that person broadcasts, do they bring a big game feel? And those are the three things I look for. And Doc Emmerich, it was check, check, check. And then we'll give him a check plus for extra credit as well. And uh, this is one of my favorite Mike Doc Emmerich calls of all time. Off the tie up, it is fair, but it came back to Yandel. Drive by Girardi, it's a Step on in overtime. The Rangers go on to Tampa. 
just such a great moment. And I was in the building for that. And the bridge at Madison Square Garden was literally shaking. And then you get to hear the call after the game, and it just made it oh so better. So, uh, Samter, what do you got cooking? Who is your favorite play-by-play guy of all time? So my favorite play-by-play guy of all time is a guy that I, I've worked with a lot, and he's just the nicest guy, and he, he does everything. But the one problem I have with this exercise was he doesn't have that iconic call. He doesn't mm-hmm. have that, you know, Doc Emmer call or that, you know, Al Michaels historic call. That everyone knows. That everyone mm-hmm. knows. Uh, so my favorite personal guy to listen to is Kevin Harlan. Whether it's NFL or the NBA, he's just so fun and interesting. And I've, I've worked with him. He's just the nicest guy. Yeah, he's the best. And so while there's not the iconic call, there is this incredibly, hilariously funny, amazing call from 2016. Hey, somebody has run out on the field. Some goofball <laughs> in a hat and a red shirt. Now he takes off the shirt. He's running down the middle by the 50. He's at the 30. He's bare-chested and banging his chest. Now he runs the opposite way. He runs at the 50. He runs at the 40. The guy is drunk, but there he goes. The 20. They're chasing him. They're not going to get him. Waving his arms, bare-chested. Somebody stop Look that out. man. Here comes the blue coat. Oh, Kevin. they got him. Here comes They're coming the blue from the coat. left. Oh, and they tackle him at the 40-yard line. But that's the beauty of radio. Because that's via Westwood One. Like, if that happened on TV, if someone runs on the field on, um, you know, and on TV, they treat it as if it's the worst thing in the world, and they cut out, and no one even mentions it. But Kevin knows you got to talk. So if you just talk and not acknowledge what's going on, no one's going to care. But when you do a play-by-play call of that, it makes it pretty damn cool. So good job out of you. Yeah, he's, he's amazing. And so for me, though, iconically, historically, mm-hmm. For me, the, the 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 calls that stand out the most are Jack Buck, not yeah. Joe Buck. Jack Buck, right? Mm-hmm. He has the see you tomorrow, Kirby Puckett yeah. home run. He's got the Ozzy Smith, go crazy, folks, go crazy. Yeah. But this is the one from Jack Buck to me historically that stands out. Outside of the you know, do you believe in miracles, Al Michael? Sure. This is the one that stands out as my favorite call of all time. Gibson swings and a fly ball to deep right field. This is gonna be a home run, unbelievable! A home run for Gibson. And the Dodgers have won the game 5-4. to four. I don't believe what I just saw. I don't believe what I just saw. One of the most remarkable finishes to any World Series game. A one-handed home run by Kirk Gibson. And the Dodgers have won it 5-4. to four. Amazing. My father briefly worked with Jack Buck, and they were all out, and they were getting food, and my dad ordered a Heineken, and Jack Buck said, Bob, you will not order a Heineken. You will get a Budweiser. It'll be the last time you work with me. So that's my Jack Buck uh, memory. Stu, what do you got? So mine, so my announcer was pretty much, for me, the introduction into college football. Uh, when I first started watching college football in the late 90s, early 2000s, Keith Jackson was yeah. still announcing games. Now, I got the tail end, but he made, you know, the normal moments sound big and, and the, the big moments sound legendary. Uh, there were a few I could have picked for, for the call, but, but I went with this one. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. All righty. This is the one, though, that I'm most excited for. It's Ack. Because Ack is the oldest out of all of us. He is the most traditional radio guy here. He's worked with a lot of these legends. He knows a lot of these legends. And Ack's just a historian. It's crazy, the history that Ack remembers. So when I texted Samter, I want Ack's favorite play-by-play guy. I think I know who it is, but I'm curious to hear your answer. It's got to be more yeah. without yes. without a clout, without a doubt. <laughs> I, I found it funny, though, that I think all of you guys may have picked. Actually, no, Samter's uh, is not. But mm-hmm. yours was before you were alive, Stu. Your call was before you were alive, too. That's that's pretty cool. That's very interesting. So so, but, so do you have a favorite Marv call? You know, I had to go with the one that came to my mind first, and that's game one of the 1991 NBA Finals. The look away to Livingston. Jordan. Oh, a spectacular move by Michael Jordan. That's 13 consecutive field goals. 
And now that, that, that uh, uh, close second was the shrug in uh, against the Blazers. That was up there. Uh, there, I mean, there were so many. Uh, yes. There were so many, but but that one always got me because mm-hmm. it kind of it kind. I don't want to say it caught Marv off guard, but it was so surprising. I mean, it kind of caught everybody off sure. guard because you thought that Jordan was going up for the stuff, and then he sees out of the corner of his eye, he sees Sam Perkins, and he pulls it back, and he and he does the up and under move. We should probably do a segment one day. Who's our least favorite broadcasters of all time? <laughs> I think that would make for some actual fun radio. <laughs> Why is Marv your least favorite? No, no, oh. no. How could you hate Marv? I, I will say this. So I had to guess who Axe was, and I obviously guessed Marv. And my thought, though, was going to be not the what, a spectacular move by Jordan, but the, oh, what a move by Jordan when he dunks on Ewing in 91 earlier in the playoffs, which was, to me, that's my favorite Marv call. See, I knew Axe was going to go Marv. But I thought for a second, because he's college buddies with Kenny Albert. You thought maybe go Kenny. That maybe because of his friendship with Kenny and how great of a broadcaster Kenny is, that Ack would say, screw the old man, we're going with Kenny Albert. No, no, you got to be objective about it. They hey, gotta by be the way, objective. what was that like for you? Because you, you, you were at college mm-hmm. with Kenny. Yep. And everyone knew who his dad was. And you guys are all trying to get into this business, right? Yep. What was that like knowing that you were friends with the son of Marv Albert? You know, it was never a big deal because Kenny, Kenny, you know, Kenny never wore it like a badge of honor. It was just like it's my dad, you know, and you know, and ever since I've known him, you know, people are always attracted. You know, you have some people that like are starstruck by it. It's like, oh my god, and and Kenny was just as normal as it came. I, I still remember, you know, look, Kenny and I go back to when uh, we were in summer camp together. And oh, I, so this oh, is before. Yeah, college. oh yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I, I know Kenny since uh, I'm 11 years old, and. I, and I remember Kenny asking me one day, he goes, what does your father do? He goes, and I said, he's a pharmacist. He goes, oh, that's great. You get free medicine and everything. I'm like, you want to switch? <laughs> I'm like, you know, Some illegal prescriptions. And that's, and that's Kenny. You know, I, that's the way Kenny looks at life. And it, he's a pretty unique person from that, from, that resp- from that regard. It is the Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. We'll come on back. It's Bill Belichick's birthday today. Party, party, party. When you think party and you think Bill Belichick, Where will the hoodie coach next? Update time. Here he is, Rich Ackerman. Infinity Sports Network. Sports Flash. And it's sponsored by Progressive Insurance. Looking for a career path with flexibility. I was in the building. No. I wasn't even looking at that. (laughs) And great pay and benefits. Go to Progressive.com slash careers and apply online today. Giannis Antetokounmpo missed the final three games of the regular season. He's reportedly going to miss the start of the playoffs. The Bucks reportedly preparing to start their first-round series against the Pacers without their MVP. The play-in tournament begins tonight, starting in New Orleans, where the Pelicans host the Lakers. L.A. was in this spot last year, not only advanced, but went to the conference finals. The winner will face Denver in the second round. The second part of the doubleheader features the Warriors and Kings in Sacramento, a rematch of last year's seven-game series won by Golden State in seven. The Buffalo Sabres have fired head coach Don Granato after a 13th straight season without the postseason. In baseball today, the Tigers defeated the Rangers by a score of 4-2. to two. Hall of Fame manager Whitey Herzog has died at 92. He won a World Series with the Cardinals in 1982. Three division titles in St. Louis after winning three straight with the Royals in the 70s. I'm Rich Ackerman. This is the Infinity Sports Network. Follow us on Instagram. Our handle is Infinity Sports Network. That's Infinity Sports Network to follow us on Instagram. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining.
Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Listening to the Infinity Sports Network. All right, it is the Infinity Sports Network. This is the Zach Gelb Show. And first, let me give you a quick little read from our friends at the Navy Federal Credit Union, the Defense Supplier of the Week, sponsored by the Navy Federal Credit Union, who proudly serves the Armed Forces DOD veterans and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Uh, this week's player is Suns big man Yusuf Nurkic. In Sunday's win over the Timberwolves, Nurkic had five steals and a block to help the Suns avoid the play-in tournament. Phoenix, as a team, had 13 steals in the game. Uh, Bill Belichick, you know, the hoodie, 
it's uh, Bill Belichick. I'm uh, given a coach's clinic at uh, Nebraska, and I've been uh, basically stalking the Washington program because my son's the defensive coordinator. He's uh, turning 72 years old today. So congratulations. Happy, happy, happy to the hoodie, Bill Belichick. It is weird. I don't know if you guys feel this way. Sam Stu, I don't know if you felt this way yet. But as we inch closer and closer to the start of the football season, and now everything pops back up, right? Football's right in the front of the mind again because you got the draft coming up next Thursday. It is bizarre that we're about to enter the NFL draft. And you'll have Nick Saban on ESPN, on the ESPN, a part of their college coverage and breaking down college players for the draft. Is he on the Ocho this year? Oh, <laughs> good, good line out of you. Um, and you don't have Bill Belichick in a draft room. So Belichick... Gone from the NFL now. Saban gone from college football. And his coaching career is... Oh, the only way Saban comes on back is to the NFL. And I don't think that's going to happen. But he's not coming back to coach college again. Because he doesn't like the name, image, and likeness and the transfer portal and all that stuff. But Belichick wanted a job. And he interviewed for the Falcons job. Thought he was going to get the Falcons job. And then I guess Rich McKay was in the ear of Arthur Blank. It's been in the ear of Arthur Blank for a long time and basically said, hey, there's a lot of guys in this building that don't want Bill in here. They don't think they could work with Bill because Bill in all likelihood would have fired everybody or after a year would have played nice for a year or gave you like the cold shoulder or a blank stare for a year and then fire you. So I guess that had enough power and Arthur Blank said, okay, we're going to bring someone back that we know in Raheem Morris, which by the way, I have actually opened up on the and warmed up to the Raheem Morris hire. It was nothing ever against Raheem Morris. I just thought it was a faulty process because it seemed like Blank wanted to hire Belichick and then he was talked out of it, which is just something I don't believe, but it doesn't mean that Raheem Morris can't have success. But when I start to think, and I was thinking long and hard about it today, where Bill Belichick could wind up next, I was only really able to come up with three destinations. And... I think one of them, actually two of them, are realistic. One, I think, would be a long shot. I'll give you the one long shot first. Because the guy I'd have replacing him is very popular. He is a good coach so far. And that's the Dolphins. Where Stephen Ross, you know, he's never afraid to try to flirt with the big names. There was always that thought that maybe Belichick or it was briefly would wind up in division and be coaching the Dolphins. Let's just say the Dolphins regress this year. And I don't think Mike McDaniel should be fired because he's made the playoffs, right, back-to-back -back years. I know they had a bad end to the season this year. But let's just say they miss the playoffs. They go like seven wins. Tua doesn't look good. That would be a surprise one because I do believe that McDaniel should be brought back to try to correct the wrong in year four. But it wouldn't shock me necessarily with Stephen Ross only getting older and older and older if he goes for the big star and try to bring in Bill Belichick. And I know he didn't bring in Bill Parcells to coach the team, but he did once bring in Bill Parcells to run his team later on um, in the life of Bill Parcells. The other two, it's the Giants. You know Bill has so much respect for the Giants. I don't think the Giants are going to be any good this year. If the Giants, though, draft the quarterback, does that buy this regime and does that buy Brian Dayball another year? Like, do you give him this year and then the young quarterback's second year? Potentially, but if you have, and I expect there to be four quarterbacks going in the top five, and then the Giants pass on a QB at six, it may be the right time to move on from Brian Dayball a year from now, when you know that for sure, and we all know that Daniel Jones isn't the guy, but then it'd be another year where Daniel Jones shows he isn't the guy and the Giants end up disappointing. And then, number one destination, I think the most likely destination, it's the drama Dallas Shokin Cowboys. I'm actually starting to think the Cowboys don't make the playoffs, by the way. I do not like what I've been hearing this offseason about the Cowboys. They have not improved their team. You know, CeeDee Lamb will eventually show up. Dak is on a prove-it year. McCarthy, lame duck coach, final year of his contract on a prove-it year. There's always a lot of distractions with the Cowboys, and this is the cycle. And the last few years, they've been able to deal with the distractions and still win regular season games, 12 games a year. But this could be the year with some teams getting better in the NFC, where I don't think they'll be putrid. 
But maybe they go like nine and eight. And maybe all the drama catches up to them. And then Jerry Jones, who everyone thinks is impatient, but he actually has more patience than what people think. Maybe then he says, okay, I'm not firing McCarthy. Just like how he didn't fire Jason Garrett. The contract's up. And then you go make a mad dash at Bill Belichick, who he's already hyping up saying, not that long ago, Jerry Jones. Oh, yeah, I could definitely work with Bill Belichick. Both of us have a mutual respect for one another. Okay, Zach Gilb show on the Infinity Sports Network. Two coaches that got a lot of pressure on them as we enter the college football season with spring ball here. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining.
45 seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. And beyond! He's live. He's nationwide. This is the Zach Gelb Show. Yo, yo, what's shaking? Hour number two of our radio program. That's right. It is the Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. Field Yates, who does a great job, ESPN NFL draft expert. He's going to join us coming up 40 minutes from now. I was watching Field Yates. Hmm. When was this? I was on a plane trying to think what I was on a plane. I don't believe it was for the final four. Somewhere else where I was on a plane and it was draft coverage and he was doing a podcast uh, with Mina Kimes. Oh, I know what it was. It was uh, when I was going to Orlando for that uh, bachelor party that I uh, did go on the back-to-back bachelor party. I'm like, when was I on a plane after the Super Bowl that wasn't the final four? It was like, hey, dummy. It was for Orlando and it was for Puerto Rico. And he was great. And I know now he's a part of, like, the main draft coverage for ESPN. So well-deserved for Field Yates. He'll stop by 40 minutes from now. Um, I got to start off this hour, though, with a little college football. I think there's two coaches this year where when we talk about pressure, there's many different meanings of pressure. Like pressure to win a championship, pressure where you could lose your job, You know, pressure from the fan base where people are starting to get a little tired with the same old, same old. There's many different meanings of pressure. And just because you say there's pressure on a coach doesn't mean that that coach is in danger of getting fired. So I'm going to give you two coaches. One, I don't think this coach is in danger of getting fired, but the other absolutely is. So let me start off with the coach that could be endangered of getting fired first. And that's Billy Napier at Florida. You know, I thought Billy Napier was deserving of a big job. In year one, I actually thought, I remember saying this at the time, and people were like, oh, you're crazy. And and maybe it was a little bit, I could admit, it may have been a loser mentality by your boy. But remember when Florida opened up the college football season two years ago, playing Utah, and yet Anthony Richardson at quarterback, and Anthony Richardson and the Florida Gators won the game. I remember getting on the air that Monday. I think the game was, it was over Labor Day weekend, so I don't remember if it was a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, because that first week, the games are all crazy. They're all spread out. And I remember saying, yes, a win is obviously great, but it's going to set unrealistic expectations. Because Florida... From a football fan base, like the Florida Gators, they were the program with Urban Meyer. They were an absolute dominant force. And they've never been able to recapture that winning and that magic ever since Urban Meyer did walk away. And they've had a bunch of different coaches. So when you have, right, a young up-and-coming coach coming into a university, and in his first game, boom, boom, beats Utah, who that year had college football playoff expectations, where it was Anthony Richardson going up against Cam Rising. Yeah, you want to win, but then the winning of that creates expectations that you're going to be ready this year. And as the season did go on, 
we got to see Florida wasn't as good as the way that they displayed in week one up against Utah. So it's one thing to say it that way. And then the following season, you got to find a way to improve. Like you go year one, six and seven, especially in a passionate fan base like Florida, you know, some people will be upset. There will be an uproar, but no one's going to be calling for your job seriously after a one year, but you follow up that one season and then you go five and seven. It's like, Oh boy, you go six and seven, you go five and seven. Is this just another one of those coaches that was successful at a smaller school? And then when you put the big boy pants on and you go inside the SEC and you get a big time job, you're just not fit to lead this team. Because Billy Napier at Louisiana, right, he had back to back to back double digit win seasons. You know, he first got there in 2018, they were seven and seven, then they were 11 and three. Then they were 10-1, and one, and then he was 12-1. and one. Like, he was a hot name. And obviously, you see how hot his name was that he landed the Florida job. Because even though, right, Florida, I don't want to say it hasn't been a good job. They haven't been good on the field. Florida is still a good job, and it's still a big job, a top 25 job in college football. But when you go 6-7, and seven, and then you go 5-7, and seven, this is a year where there is pressure on Billy Napier, where if you give another underwhelming season, you know, even if you get to seven and six, I don't think that saves your job. Like if you go from six to seven, six and seven to five and seven and then to seven and six, I don't think you're back. You know, even if you get eight wins, I don't even know if you're back. I don't know buyouts and contracts. And I haven't looked into that part. That all plays a factor. But here's the other thing. Not that this guy is a great quarterback, but it's not as if you're bringing a new quarterback. You know, Graham Mertz is back with Florida this year. So this has to be a Florida team. Now, I'm not going to say that they should go win their conference because that's ridiculous. But they got to be a watchable product this year. Because recently they haven't really been a watchable product. And most importantly, they got to go win some games. Like bare minimum, they got to go win eight games. If you win anything short of eight games, you're not going to, in all likelihood, unless the university just wants to continue to be incompetent, you're not going to be back as the head coach. And then it's like, okay, you got to then drop back down where you weren't playing with the big boys and you go to a small level job, but that schedule and the scheduling this year is going to be funky all around. It's going to be a little adjustment with all the conference changes and things like that. But they open up Miami, they play Samford, they play A&M, they play Mississippi state, UCF, Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss and Florida State. Man, to get Georgia and Texas, they're home against Georgia and then they're at Texas, that's got to be as tough of a two-game stretch as there is in the country. You know, I've not been able to evaluate everyone's schedule, but Georgia has been the king of college football for the last few years, right? They won the back-to-back national championship. They lost one game last year, and it was in the SEC championship game to Alabama, If that happened this year where they lost one game, they'd be in the college football playoff because the college football playoff jumps up from four teams to 12. And Georgia has their quarterback coming back in Carson Beck. And then as long as you have the health of Quinn Ewers, you go from Georgia then into Longhorn country where Quinn Ewers, I know he's been banged up the last two years, but just recently you saw Quinn Ewers get Texas, we're back, to a college football playoff berth. So I'm looking at this Florida team, you know, eight wins, nine wins. Like you got to get there or I have a feeling Billy Napier is going to be out of a job. Now, Ryan Day, (sighs) there's a lot of pressure on Ryan Day and it doesn't help him that now Jim Harbaugh, well, it could help him, but it could also go the other way if you don't find a way to have a different outcome. Like, yeah. Jim Harbaugh no longer being at Michigan. No one's happier than Ryan Day. But you lose then to Michigan this year when you two play. Like, I know Sharon Moore, young, up-and-coming coach, right? He did a good job with a great team when Harbaugh was suspended multiple times throughout the years. But Ryan Day loses to Sharon Moore this year. You go from Urban Meyer, 
And I know Urban Meyer came with a lot of bad, but this isn't a thing of right and wrong. In the football world, nine times out of ten, people just care, do you win the game or do you lose the game? And Urban Meyer never lost to Michigan. So if you go from never losing to Michigan to then Ryan Day, this would be the fourth straight year he would lose to Michigan, I don't see how you bring the guy back. Now, I know people are going to say, from a record standpoint, Now, Ryan Day is one of the the best coaches in college football. And we know Ryan Day got to a national championship game. And even though when they lost to Michigan two years ago, yeah, they lost to Georgia, but his team played as good of a game as you could. And he's sitting there with only eight losses in his career. And he's been the head honcho there since, uh, since 2019. So I get it. You only have eight losses since 2019. It's tough to sit here and say, fire the guy. But you know the standard. You absolutely know the standard at Ohio State. It's to beat Michigan. That's all they care about. But here's the other part of this, too. I know beating Michigan will always matter. But for Ryan Day, let's say they lose to Michigan this year. Ugly loss. You'll take the onslaught that comes with that. But you'll probably still be in the college football playoff. And that's a thing that could work in a good way for coaches in a bad way. And I don't know how we're going to view a 12-team college football playoff. Like, if a school like Ohio State just gets into the college football playoff, are we slapping Ohio State on the behind and saying, "Woohoo! Ohio State got into the college football playoff? Probably not. But you lose to Michigan, and then you go on a little run in the college football playoff? It doesn't totally wipe away the Michigan loss, but it gives a way for people to praise you at the end of the year. So that going at 12 is viewed as a safety blanket for a lot of programs. There is some good for these coaches, but there's also a lot of bad that's going to come with going at 12. Because, like, let's say Kalen DeBoer, who I love, at Alabama. First year, teams should still be good. I'm not going to sit there and say they're going to win a championship, but I'm not saying that they can't. Kalen DeBoer, in year one, if this was still a four-team format, let's say he loses two, three games, and they miss out on the college football playoff in a four-team format. You know, sure, naturally, you'll have some Alabama fans that are going to be saying, Saban wouldn't do this. You know, Saban would have been in there. We would have been competing for a championship. But a first-year head coach, I know that he's been a head coach before, but taking over a new program, you lose two, three games, and you just miss out on a four-team playoff. I don't think it's fair to crush that coach and say, okay, that coach needs to get fired. But let's say Kalen DeBoer misses a 12-team playoff this year. There's no way Nick Saban would have ever missed a 12-team playoff. Ryan Day. I can't see Alabama nor Ohio State missing a 12-team playoff. But could you imagine? That's how you get fired. You lose to Michigan again, and then you don't even make the college football playoff. So I think a lot of people, the Ohio State fan, let me just try to make myself be an Ohio State fan for a second. It feels wrong. It feels nasty. It feels dirty. I feel like Michael Fry, if I'm being honest with people. But let me just try to put myself in the shoes of Ohio State football fan. I think the Ohio State football fan goes into this season saying, Ryan Day, you beat Michigan, or your ass is in the jackpot and you're going to get fired. That's what I think the Ohio State fan will say. I don't know if the new administration will operate that way. I don't. But I think that's the sentiment amongst the fan base. And it's one thing to just say that as an easy, simplistic kind of statement. But you got to see, okay, you lose to Michigan. Then how does the season end? But it would be a brutal look. For Ohio State, where all you hear about is the talent. And remember, with the transfer portal and the offseason, like Michigan won a championship. A few weeks after the offseason with the transfer portal, Ohio State was throwing a parade with everyone that they were bringing in. So where that buzz and that hype was in the offseason and now Harbaugh's gone, it's I don't defend Ryan Day. Heck, <laughs> when the uh, rankings came out and they made them the number one team in the country, On the initial college football playoff rankings, I was like, yep, I can name five teams better than them. 
And everyone's like, oh, you're a hater. No, I was right. Sorry. Was right. And I know that I usually pile on on Ryan Day. But I don't think it's crazy to say you got to beat Michigan this year. Because you don't. I'm not going to be able, even though I never usually defend you, but I'm not going to be able to defend you to the Ohio State fan base. And sometimes, right, we've seen before in this rivalry, you got good coaches that just can't win the game. They can be good coaches other places. But you know what the standard is at that job between those two schools. And here's the other part, too. It could be because the Big Ten now doesn't have uh, standings. It uh, doesn't have um, divisions, I should say. You could have one of those scenarios where Ohio State loses to Michigan. They're both in the Big Ten championship game, and then you could avenge that and get your revenge the next week. So maybe you get double heavy, or it could be just double pain for Ohio State fans. So entering this college football season, and pressure is a very ambiguous term, but I think the two coaches under the most pressure are Ryan Day at The Ohio State University and then Billy Napier at Florida. Santa, you got a coach? You're looking at me like you have something to say. I don't know why. I got that look from you like, okay, I'm ready to go, coach. Put me in coach. I'm ready to play. Da-da-da. Yeah, yeah. Uh, put me in coach. I'm ready to play. I can be center field. Yeah. It would be great. Uh, actually, I was center field, so it worked out perfectly. I thought uh, you were more of a shortstop. No, I'm lefty. I couldn't play uh, shortstop. Second base? Same thing, lefty. You, okay. don't, you don't get lefties at shorter second. Third base? First no, base? Same thing. Left first, field? Right no, field? For, first base, the lefty makes sense, but I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I don't know. I couldn't tiny. see you as a center. You, know, you have a tall person at first base. You I don't feel like you need sure. a tall center fielder, though. No, you need a fast center fielder who can track the ball quickly and make plays. High jump? Yeah, and so, like, you know, right field is a strong mm-hmm. arm. First base is tall, unusually left-handed. Shortstop, center, uh, uh, second base, and third are you know, righties. Can I predict the name that you're going to give me here? Yeah. Because I think I know how your, your brain operates. Do it. And let the English see you do it. Coach Prime. Uh, that's actually not a bad one. Yeah, I, I think he certainly does have as much pressure as... Almost anybody, Where but not him. He's not in danger of losing his job. No, but there's a different type of pressure on him. But last he just lost year, his entire offensive line, which he which he said, said he, he said he wanted to lose, and right. they brought in a bunch of different guys. Right. But they start off three and zero last year. They were the talk of college football, and then they won one lousy game down the stretch. They had that terrible choke job against Stanford. This is the last year of Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter. You know, I don't have any great expectations, but now with the 12 team college football playoff, you go to a new conference, things like that. You know, I don't think it's crazy to make a case that they could be the 12th best team in the country, but if you still have an offensive line problem, then the recruiting style of Coach Prime is going to get called under question because Coach Prime made it clear he doesn't go into anyone's living room. I, I really thought you were going to go Coach Prime. Uh, he does have a lot of different types of pressure on him. But for me, I think the guy, like Sark, I think has a lot of pressure on him because, like, he's got Arch waiting in the wings and Quinn yeah. there. And so, like, that's a tough thing. If Quinn starts to struggle, what, like, at what point do you start saying, like, oh, man, like, I've got this golden child but here. But they just underneath. made the college football playoff last year, and I, and I think that's yes. the big part. Having Arch there is your safety blanket, where even if this year goes backwards and not great, yeah. you could play Arch or you wait until next year. Where it's like, okay, the Manning family loves right. me, so... No, Obviously, no, sure. I'm not and going it's, it's not about and, losing... and he just got that huge extension. Right. And too. it's not about losing his job. It's a different mm-hmm. type of pressure. Now his pressure is national titles. That's the expectation Fair. for him. He's not ready to lose his job. Like Dion's not losing his job, but sure. his expectation is they have to improve and be like a legitimate contender for a playoff. Yeah. Whereas Sark's pressure is now you have to contend for titles. For me, the guy is Lincoln Riley. Because Lincoln Riley has pumped out my Heisman favorites. winner after Overrated Heisman winner coach. after Heisman. He's going to have his third number one overall mm-hmm. pick coming out this year. He's got... All the pedigree, and yet year after year after year, USC just, or Lincoln Riley's teams, fall flat in the biggest games. Yeah. There's a lot of questions about what Lincoln Riley can do as a coach, not just as a quarterback coach or an offensive coach or as a recruiter. Those things have been answered. What can he do as a coach on a winning team to actually lead them to titles? That's and, I the big question. and I didn't like the move to USC. I did not like the move. Now, obviously, a bunch of college uh, conference changes happened after that. But I was, I've was i never been as high on Lincoln Riley as others. Because, yes, he could win you Heisman trophies. He could get you to the college football playoff. But I've always said he's a very good coach, not a great coach. And there's a difference in that because he's never won a college football playoff game. With all those Heisman Trophy winners and the last two years, okay, you lose the Pac-12 championship two years ago because Caleb Williams got hurt. All righty, I'm not going to crush you for that. But 
this past year, you weren't even in contention for it. With Caleb Williams, you couldn't even get in contention for the, for the Pac-12 championship or for a college football playoff spot. And that Alex Grinch move and keeping around as long as he did was detrimental. We'll do a news brief next. Zach Gelb shows on the Infinity Sports Network. I almost lost my quarter. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining.
15 seconds. Break ends in 5 seconds. Caught up on the rumors, reports, and reconnaissance from the day in sports. All righty, news brief time. Zach Gelb show on the Infinity Sports Network. Here is Nick Saban if he worries about watching Alabama at the spring game. My biggest concern is being with uh, my head coach, Miss Terry. <laughs> I, I, I've never ever had to watch a game with her. So <laughs> I'm a little concerned. Why would he be concerned about watching the game? With his wife. Because maybe Nick Saban, even though it's a spring game, you think he's got a little bit of a potty mouth? And maybe uh, he could be a little... Uh, needs to get reeled in, I guess, is the is the right word here, word here, Santa? Is that what it is? Yeah, I think that, you know, he's, he's a little bit worried about the monster that's going to come out and that his wife's going to see a side of him that she's never seen him and be worried about the health of her husband. That's what we need. Every Saturday and Sunday... I need a camera on Nick Saban watching Alabama on Saturday on each and every Saturday. And then I need a camera on Belichick watching the Patriots each and every Sunday. That would be my TV executive idea. Let's go to Puka Nakua had one of the greatest rookie seasons I've ever seen. And the only reason why I didn't win rookie of the year is because of CJ Stroud and his brilliant rookie year. But here is Puka Nakua saying he could still get better. The standard is is still set very high, and I'm not. I don't think I've, I'm close to reaching it. But uh, it made it fun because I know that there's more. There's more. There's more to grab. Uh, I feel like I. It was last year was so much fun, and I learned a lot. But there's still so much left on the table. Well, here's the thing: you had 105 receptions, 1,486 yards, and six touchdowns. How much better can you actually get? Now I like the mentality. And a lot of people are going to say what Puka Nakua said. I just don't know individually how much better you could get. However, I did say this about Patrick Mahomes. When you have early success and you just get wiser and you get more mature and you've been around the game that much longer, the game does come a little bit easier to you. And it's scary when the game already comes easier, easy to you, that it could get even easier coming your way. Here is uh, Booger McFarlane. He was on Get Up on the ESPN. And he was asked, what if J.J. McCarthy goes before Drake May? I'll be shocked because I, there's no way you can convince me that J.J. McCarthy is the third best player in this draft. I don't think he's the fourth best player in this draft. And we're talking about drafts. And this quarterback, as high as number four, can we honestly say he's the fourth best player in this draft? Just from a pure talent trade standpoint, Drake May is a better quarterback than J.J. McCarthy. I've seen him do it at a higher level at North Carolina than J.J. McCarthy. So I think Drake May should go in front of J.J. McCarthy. But it depends on where he's going and where the fit is. Because a lot of people believe Drake May needs to sit a year. So you're a team like Minnesota. Clearly, they know Drake May well because of the Josh McCown connection. But are you going to sit Drake May a year in Minnesota that has a really good offense that just needs a quarterback? That's a tough sell. And and also, so I I was on with Dexter Henry today on SNY and and New York Post. And I said, I don't think J.J. McCarthy should be a top 10 pick. Like, if I'm running, I'm not picking McCarthy 10, but you know how quarterbacks end up going sooner than where they actually should go because of the importance of the position. And a team like Minnesota trading up from 11 into the top 10 is going to be going for a quarterback, and I do believe McCarthy would be a really good fit for the Minnesota Vikings. Here is Brian Windhorse, Windy, on if this is the last game that Clay Thompson plays with the Golden State Warriors, also courtesy of ESPN. No. I think they like the way this team finished the season. 27 and 12 down the stretch. Top 10 offense, top 10 defense. They are a quality team. They're going to have to reduce their payroll, Greeny. They're spending almost $400 million. Clay Thompson is making $43 million this year. He will not make that from anybody next year, and certainly not the worry. He's got to take a eight figure cut um, to come down. Mm-hmm. And Chris Paul has an option, a team option for $31 million. They're not picking that up. So they're going to reduce their payroll by tens of millions of dollars make some changes on the edges, but I think they bring Clay Thompson back. I think they like the way this team plays at the end of the season. They like the way that this team plays at the end of the season. Even with how they played, they're still in the playing tournament. 
And if they lose tonight, their season's over. So Wendy's basically saying they'll make some minor adjustments. They'll reduce the salary of Clay. Chris Paul will be gone. Draymond Green will still be there. And Steph Curry will still be there. The idea that this core still has another championship in them is just inconceivable to me. You got to get rid of Draymond. You want to bring Clay back on a cheap deal and limit his role. I'm fine with that. But if you just bring back Clay, Draymond, and Steph as your main pieces, it's not a group that's going to win a championship. Let's go to Roy McElroy. There was a rumor last night that he's been offered $850 million to join Live Golf. Here is a credit of the uh, courtesy of the Golf Channel, Roy McElroy, on these rumors. I honestly don't know how these things get started. Uh, I've never been offered a number from Live, and I've never contemplated going to Live. Yeah, I, you know, it's again. I think I've made it clear over the past two years that I don't think it's something for me. But yeah, I mean, I'm playing this PGA Tour event next week, and I will play the PGA Tour for the rest of my career. Uh, Rory, I know that you've been applauded in a big way for the stance that you took. That was a few years ago. Now in the year of 2024, no one cares if you're on the PGA Tour or Live Golf. The entire thing has been insufferable. And this is my biggest problem with everyone that took the money from Live. They just weren't honest. They weren't trying to change the game. They weren't trying to make the game better for the future. You took the money because it was just so ridiculous. And yes, if that is somewhat true, and Roy McIlroy shot it down, But if that is true that they offered you $850 million, I don't care that you may have lost this war with them. They would be paying you $850 million to join Live Golf. You take that money and you run. Let's uh, hear from Caitlin Clark getting drafted number one overall in the WNBA draft last night by the Indiana Fever. The pick is in. Time to get things back to the podium. Here is the commissioner, Kathy Engelberg. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. That's awesome. Now, everyone knew that was going to happen, so there's no surprise by that. But you saw how many fans the Indiana Fever had in their, in their home stadium. And then already the tickets, it's going to be crazy to go see Caitlin Clark of the WNBA. When she comes to town, I don't know if I'm going to pay for a ticket, but I'll probably put in for a press credential. I'll probably go see Caitlin Clark play in the WNBA because she makes you want to watch the sport. She's that entertaining. I did see that uh, in Chicago, you had Camila Cardoza and Angel Reese both land on the same WNBA team in Chicago. And those are the two players that beat Caitlin Clark in the championship game uh, with South Carolina and then also LSU the last two years. So that's a news brief. It is the Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. We'll come on back. We'll chat it up with ESPN NFL draft expert Field Yates. Is it going to be J.J. McCarthy going before Drake May? Are the Giants going to be taking a quarterback? Who are some surprising names that are climbing up the draft board? We'll connect with Field Yates in about five minutes. But update time first. I don't know if this is going to be Marv Albert. I don't know if it's going to be Rich Ackerman. Take it away. We'll find out. Infinity Sports Network. Sports Flash. Liberty have denied your credential request. The Bucks are reportedly yes. preparing to be without Giannis Antetokounmpo for the start of their first-round series against the Pacers because of a calf injury. The NBA postseason tips off tonight with the play-in tournament. The Pelicans and Lakers meet for the right to claim the seventh spot in the West and a date with Denver in the first round. The Lakers set up this matchup by winning Sunday's meeting. And for LeBron James, the playoffs are already underway. I've always known that when you play a playoff series, and I'm looking at this as like a two-game playoff series, when you, if you win that first game, a team has multiple days to kind of sit on that feeling, you know, or sit with that taste in their mouth of, of defeat. So they're going to be, um, you know, extremely ready for us, and we have to come in with the same, um, you know, sense of urgency. The other game tonight will feature the Kings hosting the Warriors for the right to meet uh, the loser of tonight's first matchup to grab the final playoff spot in the conference. Suns associate head coach Kevin Young is reportedly headed to BYU to fill the school's coaching vacancy. One day game in the major leagues today was the Tigers defeating the Rangers 4-2. I'm Rich Ackerman. This is the Infinity Sports Network. 
check out our new and improved website at infinitysportsnet.com. That's infinitysportsnet.com. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen 
16 seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Welcome back to the Infinity Sports Network. All right, it is the Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. And this portion of the show is brought to you by Wesley Financial. Stuck at a timeshare and one out? Contact Wesley Financial Group now and get a free timeshare exit information kit at wesleyfinancialgroup.com. And uh, now joining us on the show, he does a wonderful job and getting everyone set for the NFL draft will be a part of all their coverage. And that, of course, is Field Yates, kind enough to join us right now on the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. Field, thanks so much for the time. How you been? I've been great, Zach. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing fantastic. So let me start you off with the second overall pick. The Washington Commanders have it. We all know that going at number one, it's going to be Caleb Williams. How do you think the second overall pick is going to play on out? I think it winds up being Jaden Daniels. You know, my colleague Adam Schefter has been sort of suggesting this. I think he has stopped short of saying that this is a done deal. Uh, Caleb Williams, I guess nothing is a done deal until we actually get to the finish line that is April 25th at around 8, 10 p.m. Eastern time. But Caleb Williams can probably safely check out Zillow Real Estate in the area, uh, you know, surrounding uh, Soldier Field there in Chicago. Meanwhile, Jaden Daniels, I do think, is in pole position to be the number two pick in the 2024 NFL Draft. And throughout the process, as I have been trying to forecast how that second overall pick would go, understanding that we didn't know for certain which way the commanders are leaning. I have deferred to Jaden Daniels because I have him rated higher on my overall big board than Drake May, which is not a shot at Drake May, but rather a testament just how special of a player Jaden Daniels is. The guy was so good this past season, 40 passing touchdowns, just four interceptions, didn't throw a single interception when facing zone coverage this past year, also didn't throw a single interception when he was blitzed this past year. So he was a pick your poison passer. If you slough off and try to make him beat you through zone coverage, he's good enough to find his way. And if you bring the heat, he can certainly beat you with his arms and of course can beat you with his legs as well. Yeah. Sitting here as a Patriot fan, I want Jaden Daniels. I have already yeah. waved the white flag. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. And then with the third overall pick, I've been so against Drake may, but I feel Why? like that's who they're going to end up taking. Um, yeah. and, and it's not anything really with Drake may. It, it's really more so the Patriots don't have much. And I just fear they're going to ruin another quarterback. Yeah, I understand that argument. I've heard it a lot. My colleague, Matt Miller, has kind of been in that side of the argument as well about how, you know, is this team ready to draft a quarterback? And I think there are healthy debates that can be had about it. I also think that ultimately the quarterback is the straw that serves the drink, and that gives you a chance to help elevate players that we don't think of in a certain light right now. I'm not trying to compare every young quarterback to C.J. Stroud, but if you go back to last year, well, uh, some people might note, hey, yeah, you know, Laramie Tunzel's a great left tackle. It's not like anybody was sitting there saying, wow, C.J. Yeah. Stroud is set up for success in Houston this year. Meanwhile, by the end of the season, we're all talking about how, how this man, this this Tank Dell is a game changer wide receiver. And Nico Collins is this awesome perimeter, big bodied wide receiver that can stretch things down the field. And, you know, everything changed because of the quarterback. So if you're the Patriots, I think that's part of the calculation is if we believe enough in a quarterback to take and pick three. can we also expect that once he becomes our starter, we start to see him elevate the players around him. It's going to be tough. They have a lot of gaping holes right now on offense. They need to protect the quarterback better. They certainly need better wide receivers. But I'm of the opinion that it's uh, too premium of an asset to pass up. I mean, uh, well, you know, we can probably reduce this number for teams like Kansas City and, uh, you know, Baltimore and San Francisco. The reality is you've got less than a 10 percent chance every year of having a top three overall pick. And that is generally where, you know, a good quarterback class might have three total quarterbacks. So uh, it would not be a surprise to me if the Patriots stamp at a pick three and take whichever quarterback is available. That's what I think they end up doing. What I'm also concerned about is how large of a range it is from the floor to the ceiling. When people talk about uh, with Drake may, if things mm -hmm. go well for him at the next level, what could you see Drake may turning out to be? If you want to compare him to maybe a quarterback or two or the past. 
Oh, the ceiling's huge for Drake May. I mean, he's six foot four, 229 pounds, led North Carolina in rushing two years ago. So he's a great athlete. He actually had more uh, more scrambles uh, over the past two years than any other quarterback in FBS, 120 of them. So Drake is not a statue in the pocket by any stretch whatsoever. The Patriots haven't had a quarterback for a prolonged period of time that has offered them the dual threat ability that Drake May does. You've heard all the Justin Herbert comparisons, I'm sure, by right now. I see that in some ways. You've heard some of the Josh Allen comparisons. I see that in some ways as well. You know, Zach, I'm not really much of a player comparison guy. I just think that each one's so unique that it's hard to say with great certainty that this guy is on track to become someone else of the past or at least the present. Uh, And the other thing about it is that I think it assigns expectations to a player that are perhaps unfair to him the upside for drake may though is tantalizing the guy has all the goods to become a legit 10-year starting quarterback in the nfl um i know it's easy for us to pick these players apart it's a long pre-draft process we haven't played a football game of consequence for these players in the case of some of them like four five five and a half months for guys that opted out of bowl games so uh, there's a lot of time for us to overthink it on these players Six foot four, 230 pounds, rocket arm, outstanding character and processing ability. A whole lot to like about Drake May. We know, Field Yates, the Giants are looking for a quarterback at six. Can they stay yeah. at six and get one of the top four quarterbacks in the draft? Because it feels one, two, and three, it's going to be quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. Yeah. Then four and five is a team like Minnesota, the Raiders, whoever going to be able to jump the Giants. I think that's going to be the intriguing part of this. Yeah, I think the reality is you always could, right? We don't know for certain what's going to happen at picks four and five, but that's a really dangerous game you are playing. And and just for the reasons you highlighted, 11, 12, and 13, right? Those are the teams that uh, in Minnesota, Denver, and Las Vegas all have a quarterback need to some degree or the other, uh, and the assets to some degree or the other to make that move up. You know, Minnesota has been too logical of a team to trade up. For us to not discuss it, they have two first-round picks, as we all know, via that trade from Houston. So if I'm the Giants, my stance on New York is this, is that I'm exploring the trade-up from six to four. I ain't doing it, though, if it includes my 2025 first-round pick going to Arizona, which if I'm Arizona, that's where I'm starting. I'm saying, hey, you want to move from four to uh, six to four? We'll take your 2025 one. That might be a done deal, right? Four for six and your 2025 one. If I'm the Giants, I'm not doing it. If I can do something different, you know, a second and a third or multiple threes, who knows exactly what the compensation would be. I am thinking long and hard about it. But if I'm the Giants, the only way I'm moving up is if I can do so a bit more on my terms than on the opposing team's terms, which is very hard to do because I do think Arizona will have a few different suitors for that number four pick if they entertain a trade down. Do you think ultimately they will end up trading down? Because I look at Marvin Harrison Jr. and I'm like, okay, team up Marvin Harrison Jr. I have is the best player in this draft with your young quarterback that you paid in Kyler Murray. Yeah, I don't think it's a it's a fait accompli uh, that they trade down, but I do think it's very tempting for GM Monty Austin for it. But it comes with the caveat, and I think you just sort of hinted at it, which is that they have such a desperate need at wide receiver. The fear I have for Arizona moving from pick four, where they currently select, to 11, which is the most obvious target because Minnesota has that capital to move up, plus that need, is that if you move down from four to 11, say goodbye to Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dudes, they ain't getting there, dude. Mm-hmm. No chance, no way, no how, unless one of those guys decides over the next nine days to say uh, to put out some rumor they're going to retire or something, right? It ain't happening. So you got to be very careful if you are so intent on having one of those as your uh, preferred target. Um, so a, a a mini move down four to six to the Giants keeps you in that safe space, right? Because the Giants are not moving up to grab a wide receiver. They're moving up to take a quarterback, which means you're guaranteed two of the three wide receivers will be on the board at pick six. I think a, and I, I'm again, just so much of this is just speculation to be true, truthful, Zach. And we don't know. I mean, there's 32 teams and it's not exactly like teams are handing out draft information slash plans like, like candy on Halloween. Right. But if I'm Arizona, one thing that I would be mindful of is can I execute a similar move to what happened last year? I don't know the order of operations for how Monty Austin Fork got last year's deals done. But for those that don't recall the 2023 NFL draft that well, they moved from three to 12. That was where Houston was. And then they moved back up from 12 to six. That's where the Lions were via the Rams. If you, I, I don't know if as Monty Austin Fork was negotiating with Nick Casario, the Texans GM, he also had somebody on the other line talking to Lions GM Brad Holmes, Brad Holmes and saying, all right, you know what? Uh, we've also got this guy lined up. You know, hey, we can move from uh, 6 to 3 to 12, and we'll get, as part of the package to go back up from 12 to 6, you're getting 12 plus, I think it was a second-round pick and a couple of the things 
uh, Sam Laporta ended up being a part of that deal. So um, if you have that in your back pocket, three, I'm sorry, four to 11 and then 11 to seven for Tennessee as an example, knowing that the first four picks under the circumstances we are discussing are going to be quarterbacks, then I'd be happy about that if I were a Cardinals fan to add some capital and still get one of those three wide receivers. Where are you at with J.J. McCarthy? Because where I'm at, if he goes to the Giants or if he goes to the Patriots, I don't feel good about it. But if Minnesota moves up to get him, I think that could be a very good relationship moving forward. I mean, certainly, Zach. And I think that's actually kind of the reality of the NFL draft, right, is there are very few players that you just drop them anywhere and all of a sudden that franchise just changes forever, right? Once they're fully formed, we can say that, right? You put Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, those, those kind of guys make your team borderline walking playoff contenders, regardless of what it looks like around them. Um, but it's hard for us until we've seen it from a guy to say, okay, you know what? Regardless of where Caleb Williams goes, he's going to be a mega super duper star. I think the situation is very good in Chicago, but uh, it's part of the reason why I think it's important for us to rank these players going into the draft, right? Because the truth of the matter is that if Drake May goes second and Jaden Daniels goes third, Jaden Daniels might have a more difficult first season than Drake May, even if I think that Jaden Daniels by you know, a little bit is the superior prospect because the Patriots right now have a relatively barren cabinet at wide receiver. So circumstances means so much in every pick, but 100% with these quarterbacks are just so few of them that can transcend the mold of a bad franchise. So um, yes, JJ going to Minnesota, any of them going to Minnesota would be a very cushy spot when you have Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, eventually a healthy TJ Hawkinson, two very good offensive tackles, Aaron Jones in the backfield. Like, you know, that to me is uh, maybe not quite where Caleb Williams is with Chicago, but pretty darn close to being about as ideal as it gets for a rookie quarterback. Wrap it up with Phil Yates, who joins us right now on the Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. When can you see Michael Penix Jr. going at the earliest? Like the Raiders at 13? Do you think that's in play? Yeah, I think that 11, 12, 13 run is interesting for all for, for both he and Bo Nix. Uh, I, th- I think if I had to sort of bet my lot on one going ahead of the other now, and this is intel that is ever evolving, but you know, Tuesday, April 16th, uh, nearly 5 p.m. on the East Coast, I would go with Michael Penix Jr. ahead of Bo Nix. Uh, and around that 11, 12, 13 range, you know, obviously that's the Vikings right now, plus the Broncos, plus the Raiders, you know, the conundrum that each of those teams faces is that uh, if we don't take one now, are we going to get one later? And the answer is probably not. The strength of this quarterback class really drops off after about six signal callers. So uh, Denver's the most interesting of those three teams to me because they have no second round pick, but They also are about to pay $85 million in dead money to Russell Wilson over the next two seasons. They may say that we can't afford to incur too much more risk at quarterback and taking a quarterback at 12 certainly would be risky. Take the position out of it. Who just, who do you think are the five best players in this draft field? Uh, So, I mean, my my overall rankings do bake in positional value. uh, So it's hard for me to totally divorce myself from, from that, but uh, my top five are Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Marvin Harrison, Jr. Malik neighbors, and Drake May with uh, Roma Dunze and Drake May kind of at five and 5A. Five uh, if you wanted to do a non-quarterback conversation, it's those three wide receivers I just mentioned, plus Brock, Auer, Brock Bowers and also, I think, Joe Alt. But there's a pretty healthy conversation about Dallas Turner right there. I've gone back and forth, flipped back and forth between Dallas Turner, Joe Alt. I've thought about Troy Fatutanu in there. I've thought about J.C. Latham in there. So, uh, yeah, I think those guys are all kind of in the conversation for the best football players in the draft. And the last thing I'll ask you, just give me two names here, guys that you're buzzing on that maybe haven't gotten that much attention or not being talked about enough. It's funny, you know, when you live in this draft analyst role, you feel like you're talking about every player all the time. Uh, So so I'll give you a second round player and then maybe probably a little deeper on the board. I think, you know, Jalen Polk, great player from Washington. I love the toughness, love the body control, contested catches. He had six games with 100-plus receiving yards this past season, was great in his college football semifinals against uh, Texas, had over 100 yards in that game as well, including a big play on the opening drive, uh, has vice grips for hands. And then uh, Bo Braid, safety from Maryland, a guy who probably ends up going somewhere around the fourth round. Uh, that can cover, a guy can hit a little bit, a guy could experience. And uh, you know any player that uh, stood the task, which he did, uh, against Marvin Harrison Jr. in man coverage, even in a small sample size, to me, good enough to have my attention. He is Field Yates. He is a rock star as an ESPN NFL draft expert. You can watch him this time of the year. He's everywhere. Field, we appreciate you carving out some time for us. Thanks, Zach. Take care, man. You got it. There he is, Field Yates, with a comprehensive draft breakdown uh, with us on the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports. uh, Oh, the Infinity Sports Network. See? Got to give my quarter. That's now 50 cents. 
We're two days into this uh, new name of the network, and I've already had to uh, drop off 50 cents into the big jar. Jeez. I have to call my agent. Got a new boss in town, Ryan Hurley. Spike out, Ryan Hurley in. We have to do new uh, expedited contract negotiations. <laughs> Good stuff with Fields. We're coming on back when we return. We got to talk about these quarterbacks. You could suggest when they're going to go. What's the best fit for these quarterbacks? The big five that we've been talking about. Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining.
30 seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. To infinity and beyond. He's live. He's nationwide. This is the Zach Gelb Show. Here's your host, Zach Gelb. Yo, yo, hour number three of our radio program. It's the Infinity Sports Network. It is the Zach Gelb Show. We are in draft mode this time of the year. We're gearing up for next week. We're next Thursday. 32 picks. Can't wait for it in the first round. Where all the months and months and months of speculation goes right into the trash can. And we figure out what the reality of the situation is. Now, I want to do a segment here where it's based off the quarterbacks. Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy, Drake May, and Michael Penix Jr. But before we do this and talk about what's the best and most realistic fit, when you have a Venn diagram, you put the best, and then you put realistic, and you get the middle part of the Venn diagram, and that's going to spit out the answer for us. Because I could sit here and say, Oh, for Caleb Williams, let's look uh, deep down the board. The best fit could be the Buffalo Bills or the Detroit Lions. We know the Lions aren't A, trading up. We know the Bills aren't trading up to get a quarterback because they're not going to get rid of Jared Goff or Josh Allen, and nor should they get rid of Josh Allen. For Caleb Williams, uh, I would get rid of Jared Goff, but not Josh Allen. So we'll do that in just a second. But my most fascinating takeaway from the Field Yates conversation, Samter, like, I ask you how many quarterbacks are going to go in the first round. You would agree, right, the number is five? You think five quarterbacks are going to go in the first round? I think that's pretty easy peasy with the way this has been talked about. With a chance at six. See, that's the part I've never even contemplated. When he talked, when I asked him, hey, Michael Penix Jr., because... We know one, two, and three. It's going to be quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. The Patriots could trade out. I think they'll end up taking Drake May. And I have something to say about Drake May coming up later in this show that I think is going to surprise people. But Caleb Williams, one. Jaden Daniels, two. Drake May at three. That's what it feels like. I know there's been a lot of talk about McCarthy. McCarthy usurping May. I'll believe it. When I see it. So, those quarterbacks going one, two, and three. And maybe the Patriots trade the pick and a team like Minnesota comes up. Uh, do they prefer McCarthy over May? The rate of McCarthy? Over, who, who knows? There's going to be three quarterbacks going in the first three picks of the draft. And then, you know that there will be a fourth that goes at the absolute latest by six. And that's the part of this. That's going to be fascinating to watch. It's really the spots at four and five. Because the Cardinals could trade back. The Chargers could trade back. And one of those teams elect to trade back. Then the Giants go, we're not taking a QB. And we're going to go and take a player at six. Whoever the best player is available at the time. Probably Malik Neighbors. Because I got to think Marvin Harrison Jr. goes either four or five. A team makes a trade up for a quarterback, then boom, you take the next best player from most people's draft, and that's going to be Malik Neighbors, even though I personally prefer Roma Dunze over Malik Neighbors. But I'll take my personal preference out of it and just tell you how I think this is going to go. But let's say 
The Cardinals go, huh, I'm not passing up on Marvin Harrison Jr. And Jim Harbaugh goes, oh, I'm not passing up on Joe Alt or uh, maybe I'll, I'll take Malik Neighbors or Aroma Dunze, whoever. Then the Giants will take a quarterback at six. As long as one of the four quarterbacks are available at six, the Giants will take a quarterback. So if you have four quarterbacks potentially going in the first five picks or four going in the first six, then the name Michael Penix Jr. is the one to watch. And you have that kind of pileup of teams at 11, 12, and 13 with the Vikings, the Broncos, and the Raiders. Only one of those teams will probably end up being successful if there is a trade-up into four or five. Only one of those teams will probably move up. So let's just say the Vikings are the one to move up. Then the Broncos and the Raiders have a decision, do you take Michael Penix Jr.? I think if Michael Penix Jr. goes to the Broncos, he will not be a good pro quarterback. I know he has Sean Payton, but they don't really have much in Denver right now. And I think that is a big part of it because you look at the receivers that Michael Penix Jr. had at Washington, that was a really good environment and a really good situation with a really good coach in Kalen DeBoer. But... If Michael Penix Jr. winds up with Stu's team, the Raiders, and you have Devontae Adams, that's a pretty damn good one-two punch in the first year, especially with how you can throw the deep ball to Devontae Adams. Because that's when I watch Michael Penix Jr., that's my big concern about him. And Michigan kind of exposed this. They dared him to make the underneath throws. And he wasn't able to in that national championship game. And you go back to the semifinal game against Texas, the pinpoint deep ball accuracy was crazy. And how many different quarterbacks have joined us in the last few weeks and they've said, from a pure passer of the football, down the field, they think Michael Penix Jr. is the best pure passing quarterback from the pocket in this draft. A lot of that, I think, though, is with the deep ball accuracy. I think the middle and the short throws or what potentially concerns me with Michael Penix Jr., but you put him in the right right environment with the right wide receivers, I think he could be a good quarterback in this league. But it seemed like this, Samter, when it came to Field Yates, and he even said it with the date, right? I don't know if he thought that was going to get aggregated and pumped out there, but he said it with the date, like today, closing in on 5 p.m. Eastern time, when he said it a few moments ago on April 16th, I have Michael Penix Jr. over Bo Nix. I I have not heard a peep about Bo Nix in this draft process. And I'll reveal this, and this is not anything that's crazy. I've been trying to get Bo Nix on this show for the last month. I have a connection to the Bo Nix camp. And everyone's busy this time of the year because you're going on all these visits, especially when you're a quarterback. So me saying that Bo Nix has been busy and Bo Nix has been on a lot of meetings isn't this great revelation. But maybe the Bo Nix market is a little bit more active than what we thought. I would still be surprised if he goes in the first round. But what Field Yates just said makes me wonder if at the back end of the first round, if a team tries to move up from the second round and get a head start, or early on in the second round, let's see, like the first seven picks of the second round. Carolina's not taking a quarterback. Let's see the Patriots pass on a quarterback at three. Could Bo Nix be in play at 34? I guess. Um, Arizona won't. The Commanders can take a quarterback, so they won't. The Chargers won't. Tennessee at 38 won't. And you have Carolina at 39, they won't. So Bo Nix. Maybe at the end of the first round, but that that or the first three picks, Carolina, New England, Arizona, maybe even four, Washington, I think those first four picks of the second round is Bo Nix territory, just maybe not with any of those four teams that we do talk about. But I was surprised that when I said I have five quarterbacks go in the first round and like is Penix, you know, next guy off the board, how early? And he's like, eh, don't sleep on, on Bo Nix. But I... Right? It seems like you haven't heard Bo Nix's name at all during this draft process. No, but I mean, if we're talking about four quarterbacks potentially going in the top six, then you've got 
26 other picks to get these other two quarterbacks yeah. in, it's not unfeasible. There's a lot of teams that need a quarterback, and getting that extra year, having a, fi- a first-round quarterback in that fifth, fifth year, year it's big. it makes a big deal with these quarterback salaries. So this is why Lamar Jackson went 32, why the Ravens traded up to get him there. Well, should have been earlier. In the For sure, but, but the reason why the Ravens traded up was they were like, We'd rather have him in the first round, get that extra year in case he does pan yeah. out, than take him in the second or third round or whatever he could have fallen down to. So there's this extreme value in in taking the guy in the first round. So if if a, if a team like the Broncos or the Vikings or whoever it is or the Raiders can't get one of those top five guys, or maybe they have Knicks above Penix, it makes sense. I'd rather take Penix or Knicks or whatever. In the first round, even at 13-14, even if it's a huge reach, if you think that he could be your quarterback, then wait until the second, third, fourth round. Because look at the Titans, for example, right? They With they Levis. Have, with Will Levis. But, but even, also, even just real Will, quickly, yeah. in that draft, if you recall, three quarterbacks did go early. You had Young one, yep. you had Stroud two, yep. Richardson four, yep. and then everyone thought Levis was going to be a first-round pick, maybe in the top five. He didn't go until the second round. And same thing with Malik Willis for the Titans the year before that slid Went down. Went to the third round. So... With with Levis, if he ends up panning out, the Titans have to, you know, they have less time to evaluate. It's a good him. problem to have, though. But I get what you're saying. But so so part of it is they have to know for sure if he's the guy. Yeah. But now you have less time to make the decision on whether you'll or know not- that after this year, though. You will know this year if he's capable of being the guy. Because yes. what they did was they said this off season, okay, we already have DeAndre Hopkins. We're gonna go get you. We'll overpay. We'll get you Calvin Ridley. We'll bring in Tony Pollard, who's not great, but he's solid. Um, and then they'll go get a good player on the defense side of the ball, Legere Sneed. They did enough this offseason where I'm not saying anyone's believing Tennessee should go be a, a big contender or a big player, but it's enough to evaluate Will Levis. And and that's a problem with a lot of these teams that draft a quarterback. This is what scares me the most because I just saw a play out with my team. Yeah, you make the playoffs year one with Mac Jones, but after that, you didn't have an offensive coordinator that was actually an offensive coordinator. You had no number one weapon, so the fit is so big. And I think Bo Nix would be a bad fit in Denver. Um, the Raiders, all right, you got my, uh, you got um, uh, Devontae Adams. So you got something there. But I don't think they're going to take him with the 13th overall pick with the Raiders. I'm trying to think where Bo Nix can go. And I mean, like, the Vikings make sense. Bo Nix is 24 years old. If you're the Vikings, yeah, you want but... a guy who can come in right away and be successful. You don't... Penix, Bo Nix, makes sense. You don't want a young guy that's kicked two or three years to develop. But you got to remember, the Vikings are at 11. They're projected to move up. So if they move up, let's just talk about this realistically. If they move up into the three to five spot of this draft, they're either taking Drake May or J.J. McCarthy. Jaden Daniels is going to. So they're, they would either take Drake May or J.J. McCarthy. They don't move up at a, at 11 they can't move up. I got to think it's Michael Penix Jr. is the guy. I feel better about Michael Penix Jr. than I do with Bo Nix. I think the spot Bo Nix goes to is where there's already an established quarterback. And they say, okay, if this quarterback doesn't pan out or we don't get a deal done with this quarterback, then that could be the quarterback of the future. And you know who the two teams are? It's the Dolphins and the Dallas Cowboys. And before everyone says, Zach, what the heck are you talking about? Like, well, what drugs are you on? Neither of those teams have got a deal done yet with Dak Prescott or Tua Tunga Vailoa. Both of them are in the final year of their contract. No long-term extension. So, is it crazy to see a team set up a potential plan if you can't get a deal done. And I get it. You could slap the franchise tag on Tua. And Dak Prescott, you can't. But that could be kind of an insurance move. I don't know. Like what the Eagles did with Jalen Hurts. And they already paid Carson once at the time. So it's not crazy. But I feel as if Bo Nix is going to land probably in a spot where, like, if Denver gets him, they'll find a way, and I know they don't have a lot of capital, but to trade up somewhere in the second round and get into the second round to get him. But if he's going to go in the first round or the early second round, you know, you got to think 
maybe back end of the first round. Like, I don't know if Dallas takes him in the first. I don't think the Dolphins would take him in the first. But that second round, you go move up and go get a guy if you see falling just to be there in case you don't get a deal done with Dak or Tua. And both those guys are good quarterbacks. But that's like that's where I think Bo Nix is going. I never really thought of Bo Nix being a first-round pick until Field Yates said it. So, anyway, let's take a timeout here. When we come on back on the Infinity Sports Network, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy, Caleb Williams, Michael Penix, and Drake May. When you combine the best and the most realistic fit, who's the team that we will spit out to you? 855-212-4227. 855-212-4227. Zach Gelb showing the Infinity Sports Network. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining.
45 seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Listening to the Infinity Sports Network. It is the Infinity Sports Network. You could stream us youtube.com slash at Infinity Sports Net. So Chef Michael, Michael in California, gave an interesting suggestion. And I don't think this has been a team that we've talked about yet, about potentially drafting a quarterback, but I don't hate it. And they have an early-ish pick in the draft they're like in the middle part of the draft and that's the New Orleans Saints they don't have a quarterback of the future now this is a tricky part you don't just take a quarterback to take a quarterback but they're sitting there at 14 Michael Penix Jr. still there at 14 do you pass on him now let's say Bo Nix falls into the second round do you pass on him at 45 when you have your second round pick Uh, That's another team that you got to look at. Now, here's the problem, though, with those two guys in particular. If this was a conversation about Drake May, slam dunk because he's younger. Bo Nix is already 24. He turns 25 in February. Michael Penix Jr. is 23. He turns 24 next month. Can you sit Michael Penix Jr. or Bo Nix For a year? Mm, Probably not. But here's the other part, too. Derek Carr just ain't that good. So if you think Michael Penix Jr. or Bo Nix is that dude for your team, whether it's in the first round or the second round, I'm not caring about the feelings of Derek Carr. But this is something that Stu knows and I know. Uh, Derek Carr is not going to be a good soldier. And Dennis Allen does love Derek Carr. So I'd be surprised if the Saints end up taking Michael Penix Jr. Because they do believe he'll be a first-round pick. But in the second round, I don't think it's crazy that Bo Nick starts to fall. You go get him. Now, dead cap, I know it's not as we once explained. You can move it around with the, the post cuts and things like that. Uh, the dead cap, though, for next year with Derek Carr, 50 million dollars 2026 28 million dollars and he's a free agent in 2027 you know good on Derek Carr not one of my favorites if you listen to this show but he went from being released from the Raiders into getting a four-year 150 million dollar contract from the Saints so what's your honest analysis of Derek Carr because I don't want to say I hate Derek Carr because hate's just too strong of a word. But he's just like obnoxious to me. He's just a dude that it's always the woe is me kind of feel with Derek Carr. There was a lot of situations, don't get me wrong, where he got screwed over with the Raiders. But I kind of feel as if his leadership style is a little phony at times. And I understand you got to carry yourself in high class and high regard. And you should think that you're the best. But anyone that actually thinks that this dude, and if he actually thinks he's a top 10 quarterback in the NFL, like, what are we doing here? Yeah, he's definitely not. He, he was probably my favorite player for like five, six, seven years. <laughs> Which is not saying Not much. saying a lot, yeah. but. <laughs> Who are you going to pick, Robert Gallery? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I really, I love Derek Carr at, at one point. It just got to a point like the last two or three years where, I was ready to move on. I I have had enough with him. I was happy when they decided to part ways with him. And 
now it's just like I'm kind of happy. Even though my team doesn't have a quarterback right now, I was kind of happy to not have that problem anymore. Do you want your team to take a quarterback in the first round? Yeah, I do. If it's the right one. Like, I, I, I would not mind Penix. I think he would be good. Okay, so trade-up category. Just give me yes or no. Would you be interested trading up for Jaden Daniels? Yes. Would you be interested in trading up for Drake May? No. Would you be interested in trading up for J.J. McCarthy? No. Would you be interested in trading up for Michael Penix Jr.? Yes. Okay. How about Bo Nix? No. Obviously, you're not going to trade yeah. up from 13. Now, how about you take a player at 13, and then you trade up with your second-round selection into the back end of the first round, and, I don't know, maybe give up a, a future second-round pick or something to go get Bo Nix? I, I guess. I mean, if it's the second round in a future pick, I guess. If if they're really convinced that Nix is that good, but mm-hmm. I, I'm not convinced he is. Okay. Uh, let's get to this. I'll give you the five quarterbacks right now. Where well, I'll give you the six. Williams, Daniels, McCarthy, May, Penix, and the Knicks. When you combine best fit and most realistic fit, what is the answer? For Caleb Williams, it's the Bears. The Bears are not a bad fit. I get it. That's where quarterbacks pretty much go to have their careers ruined. And the Bears, the organization, though, is in a different spot right now. I'm not going to tell you Ryan Poles is the greatest GM in the world. I'm not going to tell you Matt Eberflus is the greatest head coach in the world. But you have enough. Just drafting on the offensive line. You have DJ Moore. You got Keenan Allen. You got more than enough for a young quarterback to be able to swim rather than sink when entering a franchise. Um, I will then go for Jaden Daniels. It's the commanders. You have Terry McLaurin. That is an underrated wide receiver in the NFL. I think he is a top 10 wide receiver in the league. I know that you have a new coaching staff in there with the commanders, but Jaden Daniels is just, I, I think there's only two quarterbacks that have the potential of being a lead in this draft. I really do. It's Williams and it's Daniels. I think Drake May has potential to be very, very, very good. But what concerns me with Drake May, and I've said this from all along, is that the difference between how people view the floor to the ceiling with him, where the floor seems like Wentzy and bad, and then the ceiling is, oh, he could be a combination of Justin Herbert and Josh Allen. And I hear that. I'm like, all right, that seems pretty, pretty, pretty good to me. If you don't say so myself. But then there's like the Wentz part about it. Where you could look like an MVP one year. And then you're never able to capture that back up. And you end up just making dumb decision after dumb decision. So Williams and Daniels are the two best quarterbacks in this draft class. Bears and Commanders is what they're going to go. And I think that's both the best and most realistic fit for those guys. When you get what's in the middle Of that question. Now, for McCarthy, May, Michael Penix Jr., and Bo Nix. I'll go Bo Nix first just because I already kind of spoiled it. It's the Cowboys. This is what the Cowboys do. It would be the perfect drama scenario where I don't believe that the Cowboys are going to take a quarterback in the first round. But they're sitting there at 24. So let's say they bypass on 24. And then in the second round, they have a pick. At 56, they can move up from 56 to go get a quarterback. And it's something that Jerry Jones would love to do. Oh, yeah, Dak Prescott is your guy. You believe in Dak Prescott. But then you add a little drama into it. And Trey Lance is still on that roster, too. I I would actually. Now, it's not going to be in Dallas. Can we see Trey Lance actually get his, his, his butt on the field? Can we see someone give Trey Lance... An actual opportunity. That was another guy. The floor is really low. The ceiling is really high. Everyone's telling me potential, 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 potential. I remember. Because Trey Lance. Yeah, that was the Lawrence draft class. Yeah, yeah. It was the Trevor Lawrence draft class. I remember getting into a screaming debate on the show. When Hickey referred. Ryan Hickey. He does a great job for JR producing. used to be my producer. And uh, host Hick at Night on the Infinity Sports Network. Give you a little plug. Give you a little pop hickster, my guy. Sundays from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern time. Many of these same great 
Infinity Sports Network affiliate, Sirius XM, Channel 158, and the free Odyssey app. And Hickey said to me, oh, well, uh, Trey Lance is the highest ceiling out of any quarterback in the show. I'm like, based off what? Like, Trevor Lawrence was the ceiling for that draft class. And now you're telling me after three years of everyone slobbering on Trevor Lawrence, some of that could be better than Trevor Lawrence? So I usually hate that word, highest ceiling, and it concerns me, and it makes the the hair on my neck just stand up. But that's like one of those scenarios where Trey Lance, highest ceiling guy, highest ceiling guy, what the heck happened from that where you go to San Francisco, year one, it's Jimmy G, then year two, you're supposed to be the guy you get hurt, and now no one in the NFL wants to put you on the field as a starting quarterback? That's wild to me. It's it's absolutely wild and stunning to me. Where this guy really didn't even get a chance. So was it that bad behind the scenes? And I interviewed Trey Lance once. Was blown away by Trey Lance. I interviewed Trey Lance a year before he got drafted. A full year before he got drafted. More than a year. Polished, sharp. Just sounded like a quarterback. And now this dude can't even see the field. So Bo Nix would be my fit for the Cowboys. Where it'd be in the second round somewhere. Jerry Jones would stir up a lot of drama. And there's always that thought, okay, Dak wants to walk at the end of the year. You need some replacement plan right away. Some have said that Bo Nix is a first-round talent. All righty. Now to the next three. J.J. McCarthy. It's the Minnesota Vikings. The Minnesota Vikings, if they trade up, I know a lot of people are going to speculate that it's going to be Drake May. Personally, I feel like Drake May is going to go three to my New England Patriots. But I look at J.J. McCarthy and... I said this before in the show, and I'll say it again. He goes to New England. He goes to the Giants. It's going to be a disaster. New England doesn't have a number one wide receiver. The Giants, the best wide receiver is Jalen Hyatt right now. You look around. I know that Dayball is there with the Giants, an offensive-minded head coach, but had one good year, then one bad year. J.J. McCarthy would be a fail in the NFL, a failure in the NFL if he goes to New England, or if he goes um, to the New York Giants. Minnesota, they got to move up to go get him. You put J.J. McCarthy in a dome with the creativity of Kevin O'Connell, and you have Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison, I think J.J. McCarthy could be good. I don't think J.J. McCarthy is a ceiling of a great quarterback, but I do think there is some untapped potential. And I look at him, and I do believe he could be good if put in the right spot. So, J.J. to Minnesota. All righty. For the combination of best and most realistic fit, Drake May, the New York Giants. I don't think anyone's made this point yet about Drake May. So many people compare him to, like, a poor man's Josh Allen. Well, who did Josh Allen have his most success with? Brian Dayball. Now, this would require the Giants to move up from six, but it's not impossible to move up from six to three or six to four or six to five. That's not a crazy jump whatsoever. So Drake May, not only because of the day ball connection, but what does everyone say about Drake May? Probably not NFL ready. You may have to sit him for the majority of his first season. Well, (laughs) you have Daniel Jones, who I know they pay him as if they believe in him, but they don't actually believe in him. And it is wandering eyes yesterday at the press conference. So this thing is over. This thing's a disaster. You could throw Daniel Jones to the wolves and hope that Daniel Jones stays healthy, which has been a problem in his career. And if Daniel Jones does, he could weather the storm until May's ready. And if he doesn't, then you have to throw May earlier into the situation than what you would like. And then finally, Michael Penix Jr. It's the Raiders. It's Stu's Raiders. I think he'll be there. Right at 13, I don't know if they're going to take him. But having Devontae Adams there, you need a quarterback. You have an opportunity here to capitalize off some positive energy from a year ago. You don't get a quarterback and Minshew doesn't able to to really pop off or Aiden O'Connell's not the guy, which I don't think neither of those guys are a long-term answer. Then next year you're looking at a potential trade situation where Devontae Adams is like, okay, I know I said I was good, but now I'm no longer good because we don't have a quarterback and I want to go play with someone that could actually throw the rock. All righty, Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. We will take a timeout. The future of Steph Curry and LeBron James, why they need to be on the same team next year. I'll tell you why next. Update time. Here he is, the Ackman, Rich Ackerman. Infinity Sports Network. 
Sports Flash. Well, both of those stars still hoping to make it to the NBA postseason as there are still four spots to be determined. The puzzle will start to come together uh, over the next four days. The Western Conference play-in tournament begins tonight. The Pelicans host the Lakers who beat New Orleans on Sunday and the winner moves on to face Denver in the first round. The loser will meet the winner of the second part of tonight's doubleheader, the Kings and Warriors in Sacramento. The two teams met in last year's playoffs with the Warriors defeating the Kings as Steve Kerr's team moved on to the expense of his former assistant, Mike Brown. There's a sense of, uh, of elation when you win, but um, you know that your good friend is, um, is struggling and it hurts. And uh, those moments are always really uh, difficult um, when you when you coach against a great friend, Giannis Antetokounmpo's strained calf will reportedly keep him out of uh, keep him out of the start of the playoffs. One game in the major leagues earlier today, and it was the Tigers over the Rangers by a score of four two. And Hall of Fame manager Whitey Herzog has died at the age of ninety two. I'm Rich Eckert. You make the call, 855-212-4227. When you want to talk to us, call You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining Two minutes remaining.
One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Hey, this is Howie. And this is Nick. From We're the Factory, Factory Boys. Boys. And you're listening to the Zach Gelp Show. And guess what? Zach is back. All right. He's live. He's nationwide. This is the Zach Gelb Show. Oh, my God. We're back again. It is the Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. I have an admission to make. For the last few months, I've been very no Drake May, no Drake May, no Drake May. Now, this is new territory for me. I'm not used to having my football team suck. I'm not used to picking in the top three. These are all foreign concepts to me. I wanted Jaden Daniels. I still want Jaden Daniels. But I have to be realistic. I can't keep on asking for the PlayStation 5 during the holidays, and I don't have the resources, let's say, to get the PlayStation 5. You know, you got to just be honest with yourself. So when I was upset when my football team won at the end of the year against the Broncos and the Steelers, screw those two fan bases, by the way. Steelers, you couldn't beat us. You never beat us. We suck. You still can't beat us. And the Broncos? Come on. Chad Ryland was trying to kick the Patriots to the the second overall pick. He was missing field goals throughout the, the entirety of that game, and then he made a big kick at the end. But I still stand by the idea that Jaden Daniels will be the better quarterback than Drake May. I This is why I know it stinks to tank, But towards the end of the season, when people are like, oh, it's so good to win. It's wonderful. What's the difference of uh, like four or five wins? Oh, yeah. The second or the first overall pick to then sit in there at three when you have a draft that's going to be quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. So I'd rather have Caleb Williams. I'd rather have Jaden Daniels. But at three, I'm going to give the Zach Gelb endorsement as a Patriot fan, for this team to draft Drake May. And even though I am scared, leapless, about the possibility and the disp- and the difference and the wide range from the floor to the ceiling with this guy and how I was not blown away from what I've seen this past year with him, if this guy could turn out to reach that ceiling, Or if he could just come close to touching the ceiling. Don't even touch the ceiling. Just come close. You're talking about an athletic, 
big quarterback that could chuck the ball, that's getting comparisons to a Josh Allen and a Justin Herbert? Yeah, you ask me right now, Zach, would you want Josh Allen? Uh, Yeah, hell yeah. You want Justin Herbert? Hell yeah. So if this guy has the potential to be that, this is uh, my endorsement for the Patriots to draft Drake May, but with one little caveat. You don't play him in year one. You punt on year one. And I don't care how much I bitch and complain in October when this dreadful football team continues to be dreadful. And I'm sitting there saying, oh, I can't watch Jacoby Brissett anymore. He sucks. Don't care. Samter, you have the ability to punch me in the face. I am giving you the right. You could punch me in the face if this team drafts Drake May and Drake May only. And I'm sitting there like week five or week six or week seven. And I'm saying, play him, play him, play him, play him, play him. You sit him for the entirety of the season. Maybe the last three, four games of the season, you could throw him in, out there. But for the majority of the season, you sit him. And then this offseason, Robert Kraft. You are a bad man, and you will go out there, and you go get this dude good, great NFL wide receivers. Because I like K.J. Osborne. I like Kendrick Bourne, friend of the show. They're not number one wide receivers, (laughs) okay? They're not. When I have to get excited about Hunter Henry coming on back and re-signing with this team, that shows you the lack of weapons that this team has. So, on April 16th, in the year of 2024, I am in on the Patriots taking Drake May as long as they barely play him in year one. So, just uh, good news for you. I just got off the phone. Gerard Mayo and Robert Kraft just called me. And they said, <laughs> we're not going to draft Drake May unless we got the seal of approval from Zach Gelb. That's now that you're officially given the okay and the thumbs up, it looks like Drake May might be in play for the Patriots at number three. I'm just saying. It's, that endorsement is very, very, very important. I'm quickly uh, scrubbing Twitter right now and seeing uh, how many bad Drake May tweets I've had. I have only think I've been anti-Drake May on the show. I can't really find anything on Twitter. I mean, I think I think the story about Drake May is everything that we've been hearing is that he has this incredible talent, this incredible upside, this incredible skill set. That scares me. He has me all the stuff that looks great for an NFL quarterback, and when he's on, he is elite. The problem is he's inconsistent. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of the same thing with Josh Allen. Josh Allen, when he was on, was incredible at Wyoming, but then when he was off, he couldn't catch a throw. That's also so who, who, was matters- watching, who was watching Josh Allen at Wyoming? Can we be Scouts. Honest? This yeah. was what I'm, the I'm scouting just, reports were. Not yeah. me. Late, I watched a few late, games late. with Josh they were Allen. Him. Yeah. Well, I watched a few games with Josh Allen because okay. the buzz was there. But mm-hmm. for the and the Jets were in play to potentially get him. You yeah, know, that's right. Darnold ended up being that pick there instead. In a, in a previous life or something. Yeah, I know it's crazy. <laughs> Gosh, man, Josh <laughs> Allen. But I guess my point is that like. I don't think I've heard anything that swayed me one way or the other. It's always been the same thing. The guy has the tools to be elite. He's just been so inconsistent. So the question is, do you want to roll the dice and gamble? And it's like a 50-50 shot. Yeah, it's a 50-50 shot. If he's going to end up turning into Josh Allen and getting rid of those bad habits and those inconsistencies and being great consistently, Mm -hmm. or if he's just going to like... So so you know what concerns me? Not be that. It concerns me because how many times have we seen people say that not... Is someone going to be like Mahomes, but they could be 50% of Mahomes or 75% of Mahomes? We've heard that a lot in the draft class with Trey Lance, with Zach Wilson. Both those guys have done nothing in the NFL, and that's the fear. Now, you also heard a little bit about that with Jordan Love, and not that Jordan Love is Patrick Mahomes, but Jordan Love did some impressive things his first true year uh, as a starter. So... Come Thursday night, like a a few weeks ago, I thought I was going to be cursing out the TV if they take Drake May. I've talked myself into Drake May now. But they can't play him year one. They they play him more than three, four games year one. They're going to ruin another quarterback. And they can't ruin another quarterback. All righty. Tonight, in the play-in tournament, go Pelicans. Go Pels. I want to see them beat the Lakers. 
Nothing anti-Laker here. Nothing all screw stew here. It's because I want to see on Friday night LeBron James and Los Angeles Lakers go up against Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors. And the winner of that would play the Oklahoma City Thunder. I look at the Warriors game tonight, too, against the uh, Sacramento Kings. You know, we need the Warriors to win. All right? That's doable. How about the Kings, man? It's so They were such a fun team last year. People thought they were ready to make that next step. And they've been disappointed that they're in the play-in tournament this year. But give me Warriors and Lakers coming up Friday evening, and I'll be all in on this play-in tournament. But any or either of these fan bases, Golden State or the Lakers, that think they're winning another championship again if they don't make significant changes, you're crazy. Like, the Lakers know they got to make significant changes. The Warriors, I think their fans may know it, but even with new management in, that entire organization is like, oh, Clay, oh, we'll bring him back on a cheaper deal. Oh, Draymond, yeah, he'll go punch about 700 other people, but Draymond's still our guy. We need Draymond Green. The Warriors need to do this this offseason. They need to find a way, beg, pray like you never prayed before. To get that someone will take Draymond. Attach picks if you need to. You want to bring Clay back on the cheap? Fine. But Steph's got to work his magic here. LeBron has floated out that idea before about being on the same team as Steph Curry. Steph's still got a few years left on that contract. LeBron James can opt out this summer. We don't know what the future of LeBron James is. I think most of us expect that he'll be back with the Lakers and they run it back. But LeBron James should opt out. Steph Curry and LeBron should get on the same phone. And they should get LeBron James to Golden State. And I don't know if it wins a championship. But it makes the Golden State Warriors fun. You know, it makes watching Steph Curry and LeBron James fun again. Where you watch them right now and you both look at their teams. You're like, nope, neither of those guys are going to win a championship. Neither of those guys are going to win another championship again. And now... There's not like a super team out there. Like the Suns try to be a super team, but they're not. You got dynamic duos in Boston. You got Jason Tatum and you got Jalen Brown. In Denver, you got the Joker and Jamal Murray. In Dallas, you got um, Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. With the Bucks, as long as he stays healthy, you got Giannis Antetokounmpo and Dame Lillard. This is a league now of dynamic duos. So partner up. On the back end of both of their careers, LeBron James and Steph Curry. That's what I want to see come next NBA season. Stu, is LeBron back with your Lakers next year? I think he is. Yeah, I, I think, think he's I back. I think he is too. Even though I just suggested what I just suggested. Yeah, I wouldn't hate your suggestion. I think that would be really good for the league. It would be great for the yeah. league. It would be phenomenal. You have these two good te- or these two teams that used to be good. And you have these two great players trying to both win another championship. And you know neither of them are going to win another championship because the Lakers do nothing. And the Warriors do nothing but try to repeat the history of the past and keep on doubling down on these guys. So let's set it up with Lakers lose tonight. Warriors win tonight. We see that on Friday. And maybe, just maybe, the winner of the game That's who we determine where LeBron or Steph goes. Now, in all likelihood, it would have to be LeBron going to the Warriors. Let's get that happening. Is there any chance around the room real quickly? Just give me a number. Out of 100. What's the chance LeBron retires this offseason? Five out of 100. Five. Five? Samter? Very low. Five, ten percent. Okay. I'll say 15. That number will drop, though, if Bronny goes back to college. If Bronny stays through with this draft process and gets drafted, I wonder if LeBron then hangs it up. That's why the number is that rich. Because once again, I believe LeBron wants to play on the same team as his son, but I don't know how much his son is going to welcome that idea. All right, it is the Zach Gelb Show on the Infinity Sports Network. Appreciate you stopping on by today. We're here weekdays, Monday through Friday, from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern, noon to 3 p.m. Pacific, big thanks to Field Yates for joining us earlier in the show. And also Marv Albert. How about Ack's impression, impersonation of Marv Albert? I don't know. Ack had that in him. It was absolutely uh, phenomenal. Big thanks to each and every one of you for listening, for 
entertaining us on social media, on the YouTube chat, youtube.com slash at Infinity Sportsnet. We'll talk tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. We out. Bye-bye. Peace. You're in a five-minute break.